the meeting to order for the afternoon of February 15th, 2022. And uh, Tony, can you take a roll call, please? Menez? Present. Prowlis? Here. Cohen? Here. Carrasco? Davis? Here. Esparza? Arenas? Oli? Here. Mahan? Here. Jones? Present. Licardo, you have a quorum. Thank you. So I'd like to uh, ask everyone to stand if you're able for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, today's invocation will be provided by Father John Pedigo, Director of Advocacy and Community Engagement at Catholic Charities of Santa Clara County. Council Member Jimenez will tell us more. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I have the honor of uh, introducing someone who I think many of us know already or have seen out in action in the community. And so I uh, want to tell you a little bit about uh, Father John. Father John Pedigo is a native of the Bay Area and has been active in civic affairs and social justice causes for over 30 years. Since his ordination of the Diocese of San Jose in 1991, Father Pedigo has been involved with several local social justice causes and interfaith dialogues. Many of us have stood side by side with him in countless rallies and marches for immigrant rights, social justice, and other commendable causes. He has been a champion for progressive change and a relentless advocate for marginalized communities. Father Pedigo is the Director of Advocacy and Community Engagement at Catholic Charities of Santa Clara County. He has been acknowledged for his work in advocacy by many organizations and has received commendations from Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors, City of San Jose, and the California State Assembly. He was, first, he was the first to be awarded a fellowship from the Rockwood Leadership Institute's New California program. He was also named a senior fellow by the American Leadership Forum. Father John Pedigo holds a bachelor's of, and this is news I didn't know, but uh, Father Pedigo holds a bachelor's of music degree from San Francisco State University and a master's of music from Indiana University at Bloomington. He completed his theology studies at St. Patrick's Seminary, Menlo Park, and holds a licentiate in sacred theology from the Jesuit School of Theology. Father John, thank you so much for being with us, and uh, please share some words. Uh, thank you, Council Member Sergio, uh, for the uh, invitation to pray with you all. Um, I want to preface the prayer with, uh, with just a brief spiritual commentary. Uh, in my work with Catholic Charities and in the dozens of other community-based organizations in our county, particularly in the city, the voices of those directly affected help shape our agency's priorities. Whether we are driven by the biblical belief of God's love and concrete concern for every person and that God's plan embraces all humanity or driven by values of community development through racial equity and equal opportunity, all of us that work with the community believe that human dignity is what holds us together as a common thread. We who work with those impacted by homelessness or insecure housing, food insecurity, lack of access to adequate and consistent health care, mental illness and addiction, violence, incarceration, debt, or unresolved issue, issues with uh, immigration, we are all transformed by the resilience of the people we serve. They struggle to keep their human dignity intact, even under the most inhumane conditions and situations. Our credibility as faith leaders, and I believe also for uh, elected officials and public uh, and people serving in uh, the public uh, arena, our credibility is directly tied to our ability to be empathetic, but empathy is not enough. We must be transformed by those whom we serve. We are transformed in that we think differently, we see differently, we believe differently, and we act differently. So we become courageous, not cautious. We become creative, not conformist. So let us now take a moment to recognize that our deliberations will end in decisions that will either free and liberate those in need 
or, or they will compound suffering. May your decisions today uphold human dignity. <clears throat> Let us pray. O God, true source of wholeness and peace, help us in our deliberations to find ways that will help build neighborhoods that are united in mutual support, that welcome the stranger and those in need, and a willingness to work for the common good. As we conduct our meeting, give us courage and patience to hear the difficult stories of those who are underserved. And finally, help us to believe that goodness is stronger than evil, love is stronger than hate, light is stronger than darkness, and hope is stronger than despair. Amen. Thank you, Thank you so much, Brother go. John. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Father Pedigo. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Jimenez. All right, uh, let's move forward then to the ceremonial item. Thank you, Vice Mayor, uh, for stepping in. Uh, Councilmember Foley would like to recognize and commend mothers out front in recognition of their outstanding efforts to protect our environment and create a more livable uh, climate. Uh, and Councilmember Foley will tell us more. Great, thank you so much. Today, I'm proud to present this commendation to Mothers Out Front. I have a video to present, which will do a great job of showing you who Mothers Out Front is and what they're all about. Tony, do you have it queued up? I do, just give me a second. Sure. Somebody else has queued it up and it's ready to go. Okay, there we go. I think it needs the audio. Yeah, it should. So whoever's sharing, if you stop, I'll share mine. I know how to do that, or I'll I'll do that. We began with just nine women at a house party in 2016. Our core leadership team recruited others. Today, we have 2,000 plus members throughout Silicon Valley. Our mission, we build our power as mothers and allies to ensure a livable climate for all children. We march, we table, we speak at rallies, we meet with our representatives, we publish letters to the editors and op-eds, we attend and speak at city council meetings. We host meetings with the electeds. We host art builds. We celebrate. We had some big wins. We mobilize moms and kids to demand local clean energy and helped get San Jose clean energy over the finish line. We helped mandate 100% renewable electricity for California. We were named Climate Smart Champion of the Year. We helped protect Coyote Valley. We helped secure San Jose's gas ban ordinance. We helped pass electrification reach codes in many Silicon Valley cities. We advocated for setback limits around oil and gas drilling. We engaged residents in Climate Smart San Jose. We hired Vietnamese and Spanish-speaking staff. We conducted events in Spanish and Vietnamese. We pivoted online and hosted virtual house parties. We taught people how to make face masks. We welcomed new volunteer leaders. We networked with other CBOs. We helped close Reed Hill View Airport ahead of schedule. We helped to end Charcot Avenue Extension Project. Now we're working to keep San Jose's future fossil fuel free. End the fuel cell exemption in San Jose's gas ban. Plant trees in, in East San Jose. And secure funding to maintain them. Push for setback limits around oil and gas drilling. 
we host letter to the editor writing parties and climate listening circles. All are welcome. Join us. Thank you so much. I was able to present the commendation to Mothers Out Front virtually. And I have to say a group like Mothers Out Front, when you hear that name, it just makes me smile as a mother. And it makes me want to work so hard to do the work that Mothers Out Front demands, the changes that Mother Out, Mothers Out Front demand to help improve our environment. I recall the first meeting I had, it was actually in the slide at City Hall. It was probably a month into my council office where they approached me about reach codes. Didn't even know what a reach code was, had no idea, but they educated me on the importance of them. And I was able to support the direction of the reach, reach codes. Since then, I've supported them and their positions on the Charcot extension, the preservation of the Coyote Valley, reach codes and electrification among other things. These are just a few of the critical issues important to protecting our environment for our children by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. As I said, I present, presented this commendation in person at City Hall last week, and I'd like to now recognize two founding members of Mothers Out Front, Suzanne, Susan Butler Graham and Linda Hutchins Knowles. They're gonna say a few words, but I want to give a shout out as many of the members of uh, Mothers Out Front are District 9 residents. So Susan and Linda, you have the floor. Are they over here? Are they able to speak? Tony, have hey, you Susan. elevated them to uh, Susan. presenters? Yeah. I see Susan. I see them both. There you go. Who's okay, going I, first? Okay, there we go. Yes, hi, it's Linda Hutchins Knowles. On behalf of our 2000 plus supporters, we thank you, Council Rafoli, Mayor Licardo, and Council for this recognition of our hard work and impact over the past five years. When Stacy and I co-founded our group back in 2016, we had no idea how quickly we would grow and the influence we would have. As mothers, we just knew we had to do something. When we were deciding on our first campaign, I remember asking the advocates who were leading the heavy lift to get San Jose to adopt Community Choice Energy, if it might help to have some moms and kids meet with their council members and speak up at city council. They said yes, and the rest is history. We wanna thank Mayor Licardo for your visionary climate leadership pushing San Jose to be one of the most climate smart cities in the nation. And we want to thank each of you and the council for listening to the community and doing the right thing to help create a healthy and just environment today and a livable climate tomorrow for all children. There is still much to do and we wouldn't be mothers out front if we didn't use this opportunity to encourage you to do it. So I'll pass the mic now to our team coordinator, Susan Butler Graham for some final words. Susan? Thanks, Linda. I want to add my thanks, not only for this recognition, but also for committing to carbon neutrality by 2030. In order to achieve that ambitious target, it will be essential to update and strengthen the Climate Smart San Jose plan. As you revisit it this spring, we urge you to sunset the gas bans misguided exemption for gas powered fuel cells, which generate huge amounts of greenhouse gas emissions. We hope you'll formalize a commitment to tree equity and carbon sequestration through expanding our urban forest, especially in the downtown and east side neighborhoods most impacted by the urban heat island effect. And not cut down 43 mature trees to construct billboards at the airport. And we hope you'll strengthen your efforts to center equity in all of your policy decisions. To our hardworking team leaders, volunteers, and supporters, oops, I'm on fuzzy view here. Uh, to all of our supporters, this belongs to you. Thank you for adding this climate advocacy to your already full schedules. To those in the public watching today, 
We hope our efforts will give you hope and confirmation that Margaret Mead was right. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens, especially moms, can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Thanks. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Linda. Councilmember Foley, did you want to add anything more? I just wanted to close it up and thank you for all of your work at Mothers Out Front. I look forward to whatever initiatives you want to come and discuss with me. My door is always open. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. Thank you. Uh, thank you to both Susan, Linda, and to the many members of Mom Mothers Out Front uh, for all your work and advocacy. Um, all right. And yes, we have more work to do. Councilmember Arenas uh, would like to recognize Proclaim Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so nationwide, our coworkers, family, friends, ourselves, uh, we all celebrated Valentine's Day yesterday, the month of love. Um, and uh, for for teenagers, Valentine's Day is um, with typically with a, a significant other, um, and this is a time in the lives of young uh, folks, teenagers and youth, that for the very first time they're figuring out who they are, what kind of partner they like to um, be with, their sexuality, and what works for them and what doesn't. Um, unfortunately, nearly one in eleven female and one in 14 in male high school students have reported experiencing physical dating violence just in this last year. So on top of this, um, one in eight female and one in 26 male high school students have reported experiencing sexual dating violence in the last year. And you all know that teen dating violence affects just millions of teenagers in the US According to the CDC, teen dating violence is an adverse childhood experience that has profound impact on the lifelong well-being of teens. Um, this year's theme is Talk About It, a call to action for young people and those who support them uh, to engage in meaningful conversations about healthy relationships and navigate behaviors that, be me that may be unhealthy or even abusive. And so I invite all of you, uh, my council colleagues, um, all the administration here to talk about it with me by using the social media toolkit. Um, I think my somebody from my, um, my team sent it out earlier today and it really allows all of us to promote the Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month. And so it shares topics like dating um, abuse and unhealthy relationships, um, which can be really difficult to talk about, especially for teenagers. I know that I just, um, as a mom, I just experienced teenage, a teenager, because uh, my son just turned 13. Um, and uh, just somehow magically from a 12 year old to a 13 year old, I don't know if, if, if it's, if it is just part of, of, of um, a process of becoming an adult, although he already looks like an adult. He's six one. I've shared with you all how, how uh, tall my son has been. And so this represents different types of conversations for our young men and women. Um, and it's really important for us, all of us, to share these resources, whether we're parents or not, or just um, in the lives of young women, so that we can help build this idea of a healthy relationship with them. And that is why the work of student organizations like Girl Up um, is so important and invaluable. Girl Up is a women um, empowerment student organization at our Evergreen High School. Um, and they support young girls, survivors of gender-based violence, and um, by providing resources, um, they uh, connect folks to harassment hotlines and even have uh, guest speakers at their meetings. Um, so I want to take an opportunity to thank Paula Escobar, who's also our um, District 8 Youth Commissioner, uh, Tavlene Hayer, Layla Azar, Kathy Long, and everybody who's part of the Girl Up for all that you do to empower and support your friends and peers at Evergreen High School. 
and um, hopefully they can also help us promote the talk about it uh, campaign with us. Um, so with that, I'd love to play a video from our Girl Up um, where they'll be discussing the importance of teen dating violence. Thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Bogleen and I'm co-vice president of Evergreen Valley High School Girl Up. Hi, my name is Layla and I'm the other co-vice president of EB's Girl Up. Hello, my name is Paula Escobar and I'm the president of EB's Girl Up. Our club is dedicated towards empowering gender minorities, advocating for women's rights, and promoting gender equity. We are honored to be accepting the proclamation that recognizes February as Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month. With 60% of teens knowing a victim of dating violence or sexual violence, and 40% of teens saying that they would not know what to do if they witnessed dating violence, we believe it is essential to raise awareness and put a stop to these cycles of abuse. This month, our club has been working to inform our student body of the signs of teen dating violence and how we can work together to ensure that it doesn't occur. Supporting survivors and uplifting their narratives is an essential step in this process. Our club will continue taking upon this important work to ensure that every young person feels safe. We want to thank you all for starting these important conversations and for uplifting the voices of youth. Great, thank you, Councilmember Reynes. Thank you, Mayor, and let's talk about it. All right, everyone's got their back uh, backdrop aligned accordingly. Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, thanks to uh, young women at uh, Nevergreen for, for your leadership. All right, Vice Mayor Jones will uh, recognize and proclaim African American History Month. And I see a former member of the Milpitas City Council who suddenly became a member of our council joining us. Thank you, Bob, and welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this uh, year's Black History Month focuses on Black health and wellness something that is consistently challenged. The COVID-19 pandemic truly magnified the existing health disparities that impacts communities of color and particularly black communities. Thankfully, by our side are dedicated doctors, scientists, medical experts who have worked tire tirelessly to provide access to medical essentials such as vaccines to underserved communities. We've heard the statistics about all the disparities that impact the black community. I'm filled with pride because of the amazing accomplishments of the African-American community throughout this country's history. Whether it is the sciences, education, business, arts, or social justice, we've overcome the barriers that are put in our way. Sometimes we've had to rise from the ashes in the words of Maya Angelou, still I rise. But none of these accomplishments would have been possible without the work of organizations like the NAACP. Here with us virtually to accept the proclamation recognizing February as Black History Month is Bob Nunes, president of the San Jose Silicon Valley NAACP. Welcome, Bob. Thank you very much. And, um, president for only seven months so far, and hopefully longer. But, um, you know, I, I've had an opportunity over the last seven months to go to a number of cities. And though we don't always see eye to eye you know, on this issue, I can say that we do. There is not a time uh, that I have been to talk to any one of you um, where there is something that we need for our community, the Black community. Uh, that you've not said yes. Um, and I was just going over all the different organizations that have put on events for during this month, um, the Black Leadership Kitchen Cabinet, the African American Community Service Agency, um, the NAACP, uh, and a lot of the other CBOs. And um, all of us feel that in fact, of all the cities within Santa Clara County, uh, not only is San Jose the largest, but it's also the most inviting when we come down to talk about what are the things we can do for our community. And at the end of the day, um, we talk about not only the African American community, but the allies that we have to help us, because if it happens to one, 
that happens to all. And, and as we look at it, if we help one, we help everyone. And just listening to some of the things that, that have gone on before this, the, the awards you've given out, it occurs to me that um, there's many allies that are right here in, in this city that could go out and help other cities and show them if you trust those that you've elected to do the right thing uh, and help them do the right thing, um, you benefit the community as a whole. So um, I, for one, want to say thank you. Um, and really, any one of the organizations, African-American organizations, could have come and accepted this award. We thank you for allowing the NAACP. Uh, we want to take this opportunity, though, to really thank the vice mayor, uh, Chappie Jones. He helped us with the flag raising uh, in the first week, but we partnered with him. It was really his idea to make sure we didn't lose this year. Um, and it was cold the night of the 4th, I can tell you that. We saw many of you there. Uh, you could have been many places, but you chose to be there with us. And in, in the community, um, we recognize that you could be many places, and you chose to be with us. Um, and and Chappie, um, uh, you are an exceptional leader. We are going to miss you up there. Uh, we want to tell you that we expect you to find another seat so that we continue to have a voice. Uh, and if you don't find it, we are going to find it for you. Um, so just remember that. Um, um, I am not going to be moving into San Jose at all, Mayor. Uh, I like what I am doing. <laughs> we have room, Bob. Uh, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like being the elder statesman type. I enjoy that part now. So thank you, uh, San Jose, very much. Uh, it, uh, all the things that you do for our community, um, it, it is, uh, we understand um, that you have many things you could be doing, but for us, uh, the fact that we are in conversation um, always uh, tells us that, uh, as it says on my shirt, fighting forward, that's what we're doing. Um, and you, you are there with us and we appreciate that. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Bob. And we really appreciate your leadership as well. So thank you. And thank you. Uh, so everyone uh, knows that uh, we're going to be lighting up the rotunda next week in honor of African American History Month. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Vice thank Mayor. You. And thank you, Bob, as always, for your long standing leadership in the community. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's move forward now to orders of the day. Does anyone in the council have any changes to the printed agenda this time? If not, then we will simply bypass a vote and move forward with the printed agenda. Uh, closed session report, Nora. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we do not have anything to report out of closed session today. Thanks, Nora. On to the consent calendar. Are there any items the council would like to pull from consent? I'm not seeing any hands. So why don't we go to the public for public comment on the consent calendar? Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe Mayor, I wanted to comment on the deferred item on orders of the day, if I may. Go ahead, Not Paul. on the consent, on the orders of the day. Go ahead, Paul. You have a deferred item, you have a deferred item on city roadmap. Paul, we're listening. I'd like to also comment on the consent calendar as well, though. Not on this two minutes, two per. Paul, you're using your time. How you choose to use your time is up to you. Really? So, so, so now orders of the day, that's just canceled now, right? So you, so a person cannot comment on orders of the day for a deferred item. Is that what you're saying, Mayor? It's a yes or no question. Um, how you choose to use your it's time. It's a yes or no question, Mayor. That's I, all you got to do. I encourage you to go ahead and comment. There was no votes. So there's no vote to comment on, but you're certainly welcome to comment, Paul. Go ahead. All right. Whatever, Mayor. Whatever. Whatever. Um, with respect to the, the Human uh, Services Commission being canceled and the Racial Equity Office absorbing that committee, what kind of committee, a committee needs to be formed in order to inform the Racial Equity Office 
okay? Because these are policies. These are policies. See, that's why I wanted to comment on that other one, because it had something to do with it. See, either we're going to center racial equity in every single department, in every single budgetary issue, or we're not. And if we're not, then just cancel the office. You know, all this feel good, uh, you know, uh, equity for all, you know, so that all people benefit. Nah, man, uh-uh. Sussex Weathers was vicious. That redlining map was vicious. And all these hot spots that you have now, you put the redlining map on top of it, it reads the same. So this was created. That's why it's in existence. That's why it's budgetary issue. Tessa Woodmancy. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Well, yes, um, I guess Paul was saying, you know, we're talking about the orders of the day and or, or the work plans and different things like that as we go forward. And, um, and, and then Paul was mentioning that something was deferred. And I, I heard from Blair, I think it was, that a deferred item could be addressed. But anyway, that's all protocol of our democracy that we're trying to work on. But getting back to our work plans and, and issues like that as we go forward. And, you know, um, uh, Paul was also mentioning about equity, you know, the equity department. And we've really moved forward on the equity department to say, you know, all our decisions have to be looked at through an equity lens. And I, I've been saying, and the science is saying, um, that we need to look everything through a climate lens. That's what we have to be making our decisions. And, and, and one of the things um, uh, about um, going forward as my son, Marshall Woodmancy is running for mayor um, on a platform that says that we need to make San Jose a food garden again and keep fossil fuels in the ground and follow Marshall because Marshall is a fossil fuel free man. And it's not what you say, it's what you do. And that's very important. It's not what we say about, because physics doesn't lie. And we have, our climate our, our, is going up, our, our CO2 emissions is going up. We're, we're in global heating, it is global heating and droughts that we're facing right now. And there's a thousand things we have to do to prepare and we're not. And so it starts with becoming producers, not consumers. And the way we start that is to grow food everywhere every all our lands need to be productive and we need to follow that as a critical movement in our community matthew raffitt matthew needs to update his zoom in order to comment okay so matthew um please sign off update your zoom and sign back on um brian Thank you. I wanted to commend the the, the um, consent calendars. I'm now that I'm beginning to understand it has really hel helped out to the way it's put together. Now it's helping out a lot more. Thank you for that and for the individual comments. Um, I mean, I am agreeing with the ordinance for the the police and fire department retirement plan. I thought it was really well done. Um, the retirement boards are important. The consent calendar also brought up actions related to the cow recycle. Um, I, I'm hoping that we can actually implement um, more recycling along those areas. I'm glad that they're doing that. And um, that's about it. Thank you, ma'am. Back to the council. All right. Uh, I'm not sure we have a motion yet. We don't. No. I'll move Someone to approve the consent calendar. Second. Second. Thank you. Motion Councilmember Cohen. Let's vote. Jimenez. Yes. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Frosco? Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Reynas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Going back to Crosco? Hi, Tony. Yes. Thank you. Okay, that was a yes and a hi, Tony. It's good. <laughs> All right, uh, let's go on to item 3.4, which is, I'm sorry, 3.1, which is the uh, report of our city manager, Jennifer. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. I have no report today. All right. 
3.4 is the adoption of statement of policy and questions for the prospective director of information technology. Uh, let's, there's no presentation on this. So let's go to the public for any comments. Tessa Woodmancy. Did it. Hi, thank you so much. Good. So issues of technology. Um, that's very important as we go forward to really work on the digitizing of our of our um, democracy. And that's how we've gotten more democracy. We've seen it. We've seen it in action. We know it's true that more of us are able to participate because it's virtual. And that's the way we need to go forward. And you need, need to improve it, you know, in, in terms of, um, you know, even the, you know, the issues. Oh, interview, IT interview questions. Okay, good. So I like that, that you put up signs that's very helpful, like a blackboard, so we see what we're about. Thank you, Tony, for doing that. And, you know, it's, it's really about, uh, the, you know, keeping that going, our digitizing of our democracy. And, and, and that's so important um, that we should never let that go. And um, that, that we always have virtual meetings. And, and so that's very critical. And we need to build the infrastructure to make sure that continues going on and yes you know we need to like you know you know what do they call it the digital divide we need to get everybody on on the same page literally and that that's and we can do that without you know well literally you know figuratively without burning fossil fuels because we don't have to go to our events and so that's where we need to move and of course we need to green our our internet you know our our digital world as well because we need to be you know keeping fossil fuels in the ground and keeping fossil fuels in the ground means that we have to start triaging what we're doing and where we're using fossil fuels. And it's gotta be for our you know, resiliency and our emergency services, things like that, thinking about it, really having adult conversations going forward of what, what is, how are we going to have a habitable planet? And um, so you know, with our sixth mass extinction on the table, where 1 million species are going extinct in the next couple of decades. That's all life on earth practically. And so we need to make changes going forward. Not what we say, but what Paul Soto. Oh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, it would have been really helpful to have some type of, at least just some type of presentation from the city on a topic like this, because this is serious because as this data collection starts becoming more and more accelerated and you start putting that wayfinder technology and just sapping all kinds of uh, data from people's phones. Okay, what you're doing with it, how you're processing it and what type of ethical standards does the city hold itself to? Those are, those are relevant questions that I would have liked to have seen what the city's perspective is now, not, not in writing but have a presentation on this particular topic. It's, it's too serious of a topic because look at, look at how much information you guys are pulling from the Legistar. Anytime somebody goes onto, onto, the, onto the city site, you're extracting, you're pulling from our phones, period. That's what you're doing, okay? And what are you doing with that information? You know, what, how is it being collected? Who is analyzing it? What kind of parameters do you have for analyzing it? And then what, what decisions are you, are you coming to? What decisions are you making as a result of that data collection? I don't remember any democracy having anything to do with data collection. You know, so, I mean, there's privacy issues, there's ethical issues, there's moral issues. And, and we really have to understand what kind, of government do, what kind of government do we have? And what are they doing? Because what we're experiencing here on the street and what you're doing inside that building, those are two different worlds completely different worlds and they don't resemble each other. And so those are the questions that need to be centered because this is the means by which that information is collected and processed. Thank you. Brian. Hello, thank you, ma'am. I appreciate that. Um, I, I, and this, I think this is probably too big a deal, but um, if there was some way to, to keyword index the PDFs so that we could search them, it would definitely help you if you had any public record requests but not and i'd like to see geared eventually towards that you may not be able to retro that but it seemed like if you could index 
the uh, PDFs that are used, the primary format, which is used for disseminating information would be nice. And the 311 app is getting a bit better, but hopefully the the inner, the inner person that goes in, you might ask them, when they do ask questions or surveys or have a comment from the public, leave a space for us to write what our problem was. Right now, if you have a problem with a 311 app, you can answer a few questions which are not really germane to maybe like the where the pin is you can't pin the direct um, request for services because it's on a street somewhere that doesn't have a, a local address next to it. But the indexing of the PDFs would not only help us, uh, the public, but it would really help you with public record requests and just looking up information instead of having to go back through months and months of uh, PDFs to look for the information you're looking for. Thank you, ma'am. Matthew Raffitt. Okay, Matthew's having the same issue. It says that his Zoom needs to be updated. Um, a louder talk is not available because Matthew is using an older version of Zoom. Um, so he needs to update the software. Or you can, Matthew, you can call in. The phone number is available on the agenda. Um, let, me open, let me switch over to the agenda real quick and I'll read out the phone number for those people who might be interested. The phone number to call in is 888-475-4499. The webinar ID is 993-4684-3938. It is on page four of the agenda. Back to council. All right, thank you. Uh, back to council. Questions uh, posed by the council that they'd like to add to those already provided by staff. While folks are thinking them up, I guess I'll throw out a couple myself. Um, uh, Rob, it looks like uh, you're the one uh, spearheading this one. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm guessing since that's your why you're with us. So, uh, so question number one is: Are you as smart as Rob Lloyd? <laughs> uh, uh, secondly, uh, wanted to know, in the view of the applicant, what are the sources of cybersecurity threats? that public agencies should be most focused upon among the many sources of threats. <laughs> um, and finally, describe your experience in implementing and deploying new software systems and upgrades. Do you have any unique insights regarding those implementations, which we know are universally problematic in all agencies that seem to try them? <laughs> That, those would be the questions I suggest. Some variation of those would be great. Yeah, Other yeah. suggestions from my colleagues? Okay. Um, oh, Councilmember Sparza. Thank you, Mayor. I uh, just wanted to say uh, thank you on compiling a great list of questions. And I did want to just comment on one of them uh, and say thank you for the language, because I think, you know, and I'll use some of the work we're doing on cameras as an example, is uh, there are needs out in the community that we need to balance. Um, and so we need to figure out how to do that in the right way. So I just wanted to comment on the language of that question um, and why I think it's so important for us uh, as a city to really figure out some of these issues um, so that it doesn't become an either or, it becomes a conversation about how we can accomplish it in the best way. That's it for me, thank you. You're referring to the question referring to Vision Zero, Council Member? Um, it? It, it's Number the four? Uh, question um, about how we balance, oh, my Granicus is acting uh, up. Okay, <laughs> the balance question, got it. Yeah, it's the balance question. Oh, see, my granicus is like acting up yep. as we speak. Um, <laughs> we won't blame that on Rob, though. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it, it's the question about how we balance those needs. And so yeah. I just wanted to say thank you for that. That's it. Great. Uh, other comments? All right. Is there a motion? I'll move so to move. approve, or I'll second it then. 
Okay, uh, let's vote. Menez? Yes. Perales? Yes. Owen? Aye. Crosco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Right. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. And, and Mayor, before we move on, I just want to do a shout out to Lee Wilcox, Rob Wood, and Randy Perry from our Office of Employee Relations that are all three helping me with this recruitment and uh, did craft the questions and have done all, a lot of the community employee and, and stakeholder input on it. So thank you to all three of you. Yeah, thank you to all. I know this is a really hard position to hire for, given the high demands in the market from the private sector. So thank you. Okay, uh, on to item, I believe we go forward to 3.6 that's the proposed ballot measure for the June 7th election to amend the city charter to move the mayoral election to the presidential election cycle. I don't believe there's a presentation, is there? Or did no, there you want to say, Jennifer Lee? Or Tony, I'm sorry. Hi, this is Tony. I don't have any presentation. I did want to note that the supplemental ballot measure costs memo didn't go out until this morning. Oh. Um, so that was distributed to everybody. So um, the measure cost for six pages is $617,000. Thank you, Tony, for that additional information. All right, uh, there's a memo in our materials on the public website. Let's go to the public. Matthew Raffitt, there you go. Uh, thank you. I apologize uh, for, and, and thank you for your patience. My comment has to do with the IT interview questions, and, and I'll be as quick as possible. Uh, I'm one of Chappie's constituents, and I know that he's one of the most respected members on the council. That's why I was surprised I'm, that I'm I did. Sorry, we, we've actually considered and voted on that already. He did, but he was the one who was unable to speak because of his his. Oh, I see. Okay, forgive yeah. me for interrupting. Thank you. And so, I, because Chappie is so well respected. Uh, on all sides of the corridor. I was surprised that I didn't hear back from his office after leaving a uh, voicemail and a, an email on his website. My suggestion would be with, with respect to the IT system is to implement a protocol where when someone is contacted, not just Chappie, but any of you, that the constituent receives an email confirmation back indicating that not only an, an email has been received, but the time period in which that constituent will receive a response. Diane Feinstein is the best one. I, if you're looking for a template, Diane Feinstein's office would be the one to contact. Thank you for your time. Okay, um, Jeffrey Buchanan. Uh, Mayor and members of the council, uh, encourage your support uh, for this initiative. It's many years in the making. Uh, and specifically would like to encourage you to support the proposal uh, from Council Member Foley. Um, essentially, that proposal uh, takes the uh, 75 word summary and adds the clause to increase voter participation. I think we've heard throughout the process of the, uh, of the Charter Review Commission that the reason for doing this, uh, for moving the mayoral uh, election, is to increase voter participation. In fact, this might be one of the, the single most important policies that we could do to increase. Uh, voter participation for uh, mayors in the future. And so I uh, would encourage the council to support uh, putting this question before the voters and, and supporting uh, the proposal from council member Foley. Uh, and thank you uh, to her for her leadership on this issue. Thank you. Frank Austin. Frank Austin, please unmute. Okay, I'm gonna move on to Tessa Woodmancy. Tessa? Thank you. You restarted, thank you, sweetie. Okay, good. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you, Tony, thank you. Yeah, so, Basically, um, we're talking about this mayoral uh, issue, and what's disappointing about it is the, um, uh, I know that this started in regards to, you know, the, the powers of the mayor. Um, however, 
you know, it was expanded, expanded to in, incorporate the people's agenda, and we had climate crisis on the agenda, and what's what's uh, of the of the Charter Review Commission, and yet this is the only thing that has gone forward is this mayoral thing, which is really you know just bookkeeping and political, where we have to stop talking about politics, religion, and um, and economics, economics, don't forget that. Stop talking about those and only be thinking about physics and, and engineering as we go forward in our climate crisis. And yet the, the, the climate crisis didn't even didn't get on there. And, and we have so much to do. And, you know, and the fact that we got the mayoral issue, only thing is going forward is this mayoral thing, which, you know, is and actually the fact that we are getting we're all of us in California are getting uh, voting in our mail there is no problem with voting anymore so I think it's it's a waste of our resources to really um, even address this issue um, when we have so much more important issue which is our climate crisis and yet that didn't get put on this ballot and even the uh, the, the extension of it that we're going to have a some kind of uh, meeting that we're going to nobody knows when the date is and and it became very sloppy and got all pushed aside, and that that's really not a, a democratic process. And we're seeing that with our gerrymander gerrymandering with our state representative, the way that happened. There's a lot of things going on without democratic involvement, and it's very troubling. And we need to change that and have more. Myra Palacio. Hi everybody. Thank you. My name is Myra Palacio and I am the executive director of Luna, Latinos United for Any America. And I am here to support uh, council member Foley's memo. And I support the proposed ballot measure to transition the major election to presidential election cycles. Um, this reform should be, st be a standalone ballot measure in June 2022 election. And this recommendation would benefit our community by creating more representative electorate. Movi San Jose's mayoral elections to presidential years would position the city as a leader behind statewide efforts designated to increase voter participation in our local election. I hope that the city council supports this commission's recommendations as a standalone ballot measure and continues to promote the democratic participation of the communities in San Jose. We must work to remove every possible barrier to voting in order to facilitate the highest level of voter participation. Thank you so much. Edmundo Escargega. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, my name is Edmundo. I currently live in District 3, and my family's been in District 2 for over 50 years. I support the proposed ballot measure to transition to the mayoral election to the presidential election cycle, as do tens of thousands of San Jose residents who have shown support for this change. We believe that moving the mayor's race will be a benefit to our community, but it'll help us build a city that works for everyone and will position San Jose as a leader behind statewide efforts designed to increase voter participation in local elections. Please support the commission recommendation as a standalone ballot measure for the June election and continue promoting democratic participation in all of San Jose. Thank you. Jake Tunkel. Hi everyone. Um, I just wanted to jump on and say that I support the moving of the mayoral election moving forward as a standalone ballot initiative. I think that increasing voter turnout for this important role in our city is going to improve the voices of young voters, women, and people of color that we know have higher voter turnout uh, during the presidential election. I would really appreciate it if we could make this happen. So thank you all very much. Brian Pores. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Brian Pores, and I'm from Local 393 and was born and raised in San Jose. I support the proposed ballot measure to align the mayoral and presidential uh, election cycles. This makes all the sense in the world to me, um, and I hope to see it on the June ballot. I believe that this would create a major increase in voter participation in our local elections and will benefit our community by creating a more representative electorate and uh, is going to give us a better shot at building a San Jose that makes uh, makes sense and works for everyone. I hope that City Council supports this measure and continues to support democratic participation in San Jose. Thank you. Will Smith. 
Thank you. Uh, my name is Will Smith. I'm a uh, resident of District 7. I'm a business agent and representative of IBEW Local 332. We represent well over 3,700 workers in the county, many that live right here in San Jose. <clears throat> I urge the council to support the proposed ballot measure to transition the mayoral election to presidential election cycles. Currently, less than half of, of eligible voters elect the mayor. If we time the mayoral election during the presidential election, research estimates that we can increase voter turnout by 28 to 33 percent. We're talking about a higher turnout amongst young voters, amongst women, people of color, ensuring that these groups have equal say in electing our next mayor. I urge this council to support the commission's recommendation as a standalone ballot measure. This will continue to promote the democratic participation of the communities in San Jose. Thank you for the opportunity. Hector Moreno. Hello, um, uh, members of the council. My name is Hector Moreno. Uh, I am from UFCW Local 5 and a San Jose resident my entire life. Uh, I support the proposed ballot measure to transition the mayoral election to a presidential election cycle. This common sense reform should stand alone as a ballot measure in June 2022. This recommendation would benefit our community by creating more representation in the um, representative electoral rate. Tens of thousands of San Jose residents have shown their support for this change. I and other residents of San Jose believe that moving the mayoral race gives us a better shot at building a San Jose that works for everyone. Thank you, and I seize the rest of my time. Thank you. Todd W. Hello, I initially thought this was a no brainer and that it of course should be moved to coincide with the presidential election. But I heard somebody speak at one other meeting and they brought to the attention the point that it would diminish the off year election participation. So that would greatly affect off year election council uh, elections and also potentially allow special interests to push through items in the year when no one basically is going to be paying attention to the election cycle. So the mayor election, the way it currently is, brings added focus to this non-presidential election. So I just wanted to bring that up as something to consider as a possibility to have some impact. I, I'm not sure how much impact it would have, but it's something to consider. Thank you. Frank Austin. Yes, thank you. Sorry about my unmuting error earlier. Um, hello, my name is Frank Austin and I was born and raised here in San Jose and I'm a member of Local 393 uh, representing over 3000 members serving the communities of Santa Clara and San Benito counties. I support the proposed ballot measure to transition the mayoral electoral and two presidential election cycles. Uh, research estimates that we can increase the voter turnout by 28 to 33 percent. Currently, less than half of eligible voters elect the mayor. Research also shows that voter turnout is more than double in California cities with mayor electorate elections during presidential election cycles. This recommendation would benefit our community by creating a more representative electorate. In an era of rampant voter suppression across the country that threatens the political voice of communities of color, we must take this opportunity to make our local democratic process accessible to all. Changing the timing of our local mayoral election increases the turnout of young voters, women, and people of color, ensuring that these groups have an equal say in electing our next mayor. I also believe that this common sense reform should stand alone as a ballot measure in the June 2022 election. Thank you for your time. Jose Pavone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jose Luis Pavon. I work with SEIU USWW, and uh, we represent janitors, airport workers, the security officers, and and more other other uh, service workers 
in the private sector in the city of San Jose. Um, we absolutely support the policy to move the mayoral race to the presidential election years. Uh, we believe that it will increase uh, democratic uh, participation in the elections. It will increase voter turnout. Um, and we believe it is absolutely equitable and fair to make sure that everyone's voices are included in San Jose elections, not just those of privilege um, or, or with the financial resources to, to participate. Um, so um, yeah, on behalf of our union, uh, we absolutely support the move to move the mayoral race to presidential year. Um, and I see the rest of my time. Thank you so much. Ryan Jones. Hello, my name is Ryan Jones and I'm with UA Local 393 and I am from District 6. I support, I support the proposed ballot measure to transition the mayoral election to presidential election cycles. This common sense reform should stand alone on a ballot measure in the June 2022 election. This recommendation would benefit our community by creating more representation uh, representative elect uh, electorate. Currently, less than half the elig eligible voters elect the mayor. If, <clears throat> if we time the mayoral election during the presidential elections, research estimates estimates that we can increase voter turnout by 28 to 33%. I hope the city council supports this commission's recommendation as a standalone ballot measure and continues to promote the democratic participation in the communities in San Jose. Thank you so much. Sam. Hi, my name is Sam Gordon. I was born and raised in San Jose and I'm a co-founder of Better Elections San Jose, a volunteer organization that's advocating for common sense, local and electoral reforms. Um, I support and our organization has endorsed the proposed ballot measure to transition the mayoral election to presidential election cycles. Uh, I think the fact that uh, less than half of eligible voters elect the mayor currently in San Jose is very telling. And I think it's very wise for the city council to look at any and all reforms we can do to really improve that number to improve representation. Thank you very much. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I was at that charter commission meeting when Jeff Buchanan walks in and he states, uh, yeah, well, you know what? Uh, yeah, there, there's enough people that want to get uh, past this anyway and pass this along and bifurcate it from the charter commission. He comes in, then we Tran goes, oh, yeah, well, you know, so, you know, I'll strike up a letter right now. I mean, it was so coordinated and you could just tell it was set up. It was set up this whole process. And then Lawrence, the dude you guys hired to facilitate the meetings, he pauses on one issue so that this issue can go through. I mean, the whole process, man, in which this got approved, you gotta check it out because it was corrupt. It was corrupt. This, this policy, it stinks. It's odious. Why? Because of the way that it was implemented. And now that you want to stand, you want it to stand alone, that Charter Review Commission was supposed to go as one report, one report, okay, until Jip Buchanan walks in. And then Hui Tran just jumped all over it. And then Lawrence facilitated it. I mean, you guys keep wanting, look, man, the reason why people don't vote is because they're apathetic. They're apathetic and they become indifferent. They're just numb because they know that, you know, people with money, they're the ones that control it. They are the ones that control it. And now, especially at this critical time with, with Google coming in and all of these developers just, I mean, just literally squeezing the city, 30 people dead last month, one per day. I would suggest that that's far more, more important than this election. Victor Vasquez. I'm done. Victor Vasquez. Good afternoon, my name is Victor Vasquez. I live and work in San Jose. Uh, part of one of my missions and part of the, our mission is to support the leadership of people of color, uh, women of color, and those historically excluded from the democratic process. And we hope to build a San Jose where we all get a chance 
to make decisions for our communities, which ultimately leads to self-determination. Um, we all know that, you know, having the mayor's election in a year that's not aligned with uh, the presidential election decreases the opportunities of our communities to vote. It also creates, it's a structural barrier that has been created not by bad policies, but intentional decision-making for power and exclude e people of East San Jose, but also marginalized communities. And if we want to make those changes, if we really want to live up to um, our creed of um, being a San Jose that's in the cutting edge, then we must make these changes that are structural and that are common sense and will decrease any barriers so that all San Jose residents can participate. So we know, we heard the messages that, you know, if we move these elections to presidential elections, more people will vote. And part of that is, I agree with, you know, Paul Soto that there's a sense of apathy and we must give them a reason to get out there and, and vote. Hopefully also changes that impact their daily lives and bring about real changes from resources, food to housing. But one of the first steps is for us to really look at moving uh, this major majoral race to the presidential year so that more people can cast a vote. And we also give folks a sense that this is their city and that in San Jose, uh, more folks are encouraged to vote and we're at the cutting edge of that. So I encourage you to look at this measure and other measures that increase democratic participation. David Beeney. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, I'm a San Jose resident, and I'm here representing the over 35,000 members of the Santa Clara and San Mateo Counties Building and Construction Trades Council. I urge San Jose City Council to approve the recommendation to place on the ballot a standalone ballot measure to transition mayoral elections to the presidential election cycle. This policy can make a significant impact on voter participation and representation. Over the past four mayoral elections, an average of 43% of registered voters turned out to vote, and with less than half of eligible San Jose residents deciding a major elected position, we must take every opportunity to improve this statistic and improve our local democratic process. Now, the Council is presented with this very choice. Election research is suggesting that moving the timing of the city's mayoral elections to presidential years would increase voter turnout by approximately 30%. This issue has a critical implication on San Jose's commitment to equitable elections. With voter suppression sweeping across the country, we must pay particular attention to how city policies impact historically marginalized communities. The data reveal that those voters most likely to participate in both mayoral and presidential elections are disproportionately white, homeowners, more educated and affluent, and US born. Changing the mayoral election to presidential years would increase the representation of people of color, young voters, and women who are more likely to vote during presidential elections. Supporting this recommendation will help maximize voter turnout and ensure that our democratic institutions are truly representative of the wide range of communities that make ours a remarkable city. We urge members of the city council to support this recommendation and to consider who has a say in electing our city's mayor. Thank you. Araceli Rueda. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Araceli and I am a resident of San Jose. I was born and raised and I'm also here representing our janitors, airport workers and security guards from SEIU USWW. I support the proposed ballot measure to transition the mayoral election to presidential election cycle. This common sense reform should stand alone as a ballot measure in the June 2022 election. This recommendation would benefit our community by creating more representative electorate. Currently, less than 1.5% of eligible voters elect the mayor. If we have time the mayoral election during presidential elections, research estimates that we can increase voter turnout by 28% to 33%. Thank you. Um, Matthew Raffitt, um, I just want to say I'll, he could not speak on the previous item, so I allowed him to speak first here, but he spoke to the previous item because of his technical issues, so I'm allowing him to speak a second time because of his earlier technical issues. Go ahead, Matthew. Uh, yes, I, I have a comment on this proposal. I, I wasn't aware I was only allowed to make one comment. Uh, please let me know if that's the case. The comment I have on this proposal is that 
the difference between one of the differences between a monarchy and a republic is that local cities and townships can pursue distinct policies from a, from a monarchy or a central government. And there's no doubt this proposal is going to pass. But one thing you want to think about is how to distinguish yourself from substance, substantive solutions to low voter turnout rather than procedural solutions. And this is an opportunity to vote no if you favor substantive solutions like voter education and especially education on how, to, how the local government here is different from and hopefully better than the government in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Okay, hey, Tim Clausen. Yeah, I would just like to re reiterate what Todd W. said regarding the um, diminishing of voting in the off-season election. It, and I, I'm sure I agree with the last speaker that this is going to pass, but I really feel that the city isn't doing any good when you come to council elections in the off-season and people aren't going to be paying attention. And that, that should be really looked at. Um, anyway, um, that's all I'm going to say. Thank you. Forrest Peterson. Thank you, Honorable City Council and Mayor. Uh, my name is Forrest Peterson and was born and raised in South San Jose. And despite spending time in Northern California, I am now a resident again in Silicon Valley. I call today as an SEIU member. Uh, my comment is in support of the proposed ballot measure to transition the mayor election to presidential election cycles, make this a standalone in the, the June 2022 election. It is important to make a more representative electorate uh, than what has been historically San Jose representation. It has only been a few generations of city councilors that the city council moved to district elections to help improve representation. This is one step further in that direction. As the mayor's race helps to build a San Jose that works for everyone, as a San Jose educator, I see through my students' projects uh, the world they see. It is a situation that has room for improvement. With less than one, one half of eligible voters uh, electing the mayor, that is just not functional. Please make the change to San Jose's mayor elections to presidential years with a standalone ballot measure. Make San Jose equitable. Thank you. Neosha Frangi. Hi, thank you. My name is Nisha Frangi, and I'm a representative with the 515 a Union, which represents fast food worker leaders statewide and within San Jose. Um, I'm here to say um, and support the proposed ballot measure to transition the mayor election to presidential election cycles. This common sense reform should stand alone as a ballot measure in the June 2022 election. This recommendation would benefit our community by creating a more representative electorate. Um, in an era of voter suppression across the country that threatens the political voice of communities of color, we must take this opportunity to make our local democratic process accessible to all. San Jose, San Jose State's political scientists found the, found the fair election initiative to be the single most effective policy for increasing voter turnout. Thank you so much. Corey Cavedo. Hi, my name is uh, Corey Cueto, and I am uh, part of Local 393. And I'm speaking on behalf of my mother, um, who's a San Jose resident. Um, I'm in favor of moving the, the presidential election, I mean, the mayor election to the presidential years. It seems like in her community, she lives in a senior community that all the elderly people seem to be more involved when there's a presidential election. They get more in involved with the local politics. Um, if you move this to the, uh, when, if it's, when the, it's not an election, they don't seem to be as involved and not aware of what's going on. So it just makes common sense for them to have it during the presidential election when, when they're involved. And if they're involved, more, more citizens are involved. So I think I'm, I'm in favor of this, this, uh, this proposal. Thank you. Brian? I'm in favor of it too, and I, I think it makes sense to do that. Um, Eventually, I mean, this isn't going to happen, and this is outside the purview of the, is to go through where there's, you have a certain time for an election, people, they're given the money from the government to run their campaign, so there's no campaign funding coming from private sector at all, and then people just vote, and instead of it being a, you know, it's a, it's very frustrating to see um, huge donors, and I know the city tried, I'm not accusing anything of anybody, but it's just, you know, you're beholding to people give you money are 
to some degree. It definitely buys you access, absolutely. And it always will. It, that's almost a sacrament in this country, um, which is really sad, but I am in favor of that. But it's also incumbent uh, on us to get out and vote. I, I'm 62 now and I've voted in every election since I was 18. Um, and, I, and a lot of them were hard, you know, and I lost my sight one time, I couldn't walk. Um, had several deaths in the family and I always made time to vote and this state really makes it easy to do that. So it's also incumbent on the electorate. The city council cannot teleport us out the door and beam us over to the electorate or they mail voters things to us. They try to make it as smooth as possible, but we have to do it. And so this is also on us. It's not, it's easy for us to shake our fists at the city council and do more. Well, they are doing more. <laughs> There's only so much they can do. We have to take it upon ourselves to be interested in our democracy. Thank you, yield time. Thank you, ma'am. Scott Reese. Uh, hello, my name is Scott Reese. I'm a uh, representative local 393, uh, and I'm speaking on behalf of uh, hundreds of our members that live in San Jose. I am speaking in support of the mayoral uh, election uh, to the presidential election cycle. I believe that uh, the changing that timing of this uh, local mayoral uh, election will uh, definitely increase the turnout of our young voters, women, and people of color. Thank you. I recuse my time. Krista De La Torre. Hi, my name is Krista De La Torre, and I'm the political organizer for the South Bay Labor Council. We represent more than 100,000 working families in the Santa Clara and San Benito counties. Today, we support the proposed ballot measure to transition the mayoral election to presidential election cycles. This is a common sense reform that should stand alone as a ballot measure in the June 2022 election. This change will give a greater voice to people too often left out of our city's politics and political discourse, including working families, renters, young people, and people of color. In the last election cycle, only one in three San Jose voters cast a ballot for mayor. And by aligning the mayoral election to presidential years, San Jose would increase voter turnout by roughly 30% in this election, making San Jose's mayoral electorate both more representative and our local democratic process more equitable. A more diverse electorate would also increase the likelihood of electing a mayor who prioritizes the interests of all of their constituents, not just the privileged few. Once again, I urge the city council to support this com commission recommendation as a standalone ballot measure. Thank you for your time. Erica Valentine. Hello, thank you, City Council. My name is Erica Valentine. I'm a resident of San Jose and the political director for Local 393, which represents over 3,000 members that the city of San Jose is able to have labor as plumbers, pipe fitters, steam fitters, and HVACR technicians. I support the proposed ballot measure to transition the mayoral election to presidential election cycles. By moving the mayor's race provides us the ability to include and have a representation that promotes diversity and inclusion for our city of San Jose. If the mayoral election is held during presidential election, San Jose has the opportunity to provide that opportunity to increase voter turnout and select a mayor that represents everyone. Studies show that voter turnout is more than double in California cities with mayoral elections during presidential election cycles. Moving San Jose's mayoral elections to presidential years would position the city as a leader behind statewide efforts designed to increase voter participation in our local elections. Thank you for your time. Back to council. Thank you, Councilor Foley. Thank you, and thank you for all of the speakers. When this came to council in 2019 to initially move the mayor's race to the governor or to the presidential years, I actually opposed it. And the reason I opposed it is was actually articulated by a few people here is how it would affect the odd number council races of, of which I am one. I was concerned that the attendance at the odd number races would be diminished if it was not connected to the mayor's race. But since then, I've taken a look at the issue and determined that really people, individuals in the districts will vote for the district candidates because it's a competitive race, because we're out there working to gain our resident support and their votes. And it's up to the council members who are running, the, who running for office 
those who want to be council members and those who are to get out there and make their voices heard. So I have since removed my objection to moving the race to the presidential race and find that it is the best way that we in, can encourage voter turnout in a really important election cycle. So with that, I will move my motion, move my memo, which adds four words to increase voter participation. And the reason I added those is so that the voting public, when they see this on their ballot, will know why we are actually doing this. So with that, Second. I shall move. Thank you. One, one other thing I'd like to say is a couple of comment, uh, members of the public commented about why are we just looking at this issue right now and not the other charter uh, commission recommendations? There were a lot of charter recommendations as, as uh, everyone knows, and many of them were put into study sessions. So we will be looking at those for study sessions. This is time sensitive because we have a mayoral's race right now, and we have several people who are running to in the, in the pr June primary. So it's important that we get this on the June primary so they know and we know, the public knows what the expectations are for the term of this new mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Council Member Davis. Thank you, Mayor. I think Tony said it was gonna cost us $617,000 to put this on the ballot. I. I know that we all want high vo voter turnout. I definitely want that. And I think everybody does. I think we just differ on how we're going to get there. Um, the county now proactively mails ballots to every registered voter in the county. We have had that since actually before the pandemic because March of 2020 was the first time that we did that and it was before the shutdown. We had, at least in, in my race, a record turnout in both March and November of 2020. And I think it was attributed, attributable, at least in part, to having those ballots proactively mailed to us. We did not have to seek them out. And to, and to return them, barriers have never been lower. You can mail it without even putting a stamp on it in our county. So we already have very, very low barriers to voting. You just have to register to vote and keep your, uh, keep your address up to date. That's it. And I, I think it's important to give that change time to work to see what our turnout is like. And in fact, I, I happen to disagree with you, Council Member Foley. I think that your arguments about turnout um, in the individual districts could be just as true in a competitive mayoral race. I also think we could better spend that $617,000 on get out the vote efforts in those odd numbered years to increase voter turnout, not only for the mayoral race, but for all of the odd numbered districts that have lower turnout than the even numbered districts that are in presidential years or have in the past. Again, we don't know what it's going to be like with the ballots being proactively mailed to everyone in this so-called off year, but it's actually a gubernatorial year, uh, election year. So I just think it's important for us. Um, I think we could better spend this money on get out the vote efforts and frankly on educating our electorate on how important their local government is and how much our local government impacts their daily lives so much more than the presidential races. So I am not gonna be supporting, supporting this measure. Thank you. Thank you. Tony, you have your hand up. Um, yeah, I just, we need to make sure in the motion, and you know, I'm like, there's, there's my camera. Here we, are. <laughs> we need to make sure in the motion that we say whether we're going to print the full measure, um, the full text measure, or if we're, typically we don't publish the full text of the measure, we do a summary, but you need to, to state that in the motion. We also need to see if you guys are going to authorize somebody to print, to write the ballot argument for the council. And we need to decide if we're going to allow rebuttal arguments. We don't always allow rebuttals, but sometimes we do. We're sort of 50-50 on that. Okay, and Tony, to be clear, we could save a few dollars for the taxpayers by going with summary uh, and by uh, simply going with 
uh, arguments and oppositions without a third rebuttal. Yeah. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, the, the cheapest way to go is no rebuttals and no full text. And could you just articulate the difference in cost for us? Yeah, let me open my memo on this other screen. They didn't give me the, the current 2022 breakdown per page, but I have the one from 2020, and it's $27,000 per page um, for those different items. So you would save the rebuttals. You'd save $51,000 by not allowing the rebuttals. Um, and then for the text of the measure, it's $30,000, $271 per page of the text. So if you're only doing a summary, you're only paying for one page. If you do the full text, you pay for however many pages the full text takes. Okay. So that, yeah. Yeah, I just emphasize to be clear, I know people often get confused about this in the public, but um, if you have no rebuttal, you still have four separate arguments, a pro and a con on each side. Uh, adding rebuttals means you now have six arguments. So uh, I would just argue uh, that I think whatever we do, <laughs> I think we ought to save the taxpayers a few bucks and go with the summaries and go with the pro and con. I think uh, I'm guessing most voters tend to trail off by the time they're getting to the fifth and sixth arguments anyway. So that would just be my suggestion for whoever makes the motion. Mayor, Is that a rebuttal, I, Mayor? Mayor, I already <laughs> made, Mayor, I already made the motion. So can I include those things in the yes, motion? Sir. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you, Councilman. And I'm the seconder, I accept. Great. Okay, Thank and you. Are, are you going to authorize somebody to to write a ballot argument for? I don't know what we normally do. Who normally writes the ballot argument? Don't we? In the past, it's been it's been the mayor's office that writes. But I'm happy to ask. You know, if, if there's a member of the council that wants to take the lead on this, happy okay. to. Uh... Okay. Uh, does that need to be a part of the motion? Yes. As to who's going to write it? Yes, who, who we're going to authorize to submit the ballot argument to me. And yeah. I, this is, I'm, I'm, I got a text from the attorney's office telling me I need to have somebody right. um, specified. So if there's a specific member of the council would like to volunteer, that's fine. We can just maybe sell that through our discussion and come back to you, Council Member Foley, when someone has indicated that they'd like to step forward. That works with me. Thank you. Okay, great. And um, there's two modifications are acceptable to you, Councilmember Sparza? Yes. Okay, great. Councilmember Carrasco? Um, Mayor, I had raised my hand. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're, you're right okay. after Councilmember okay. Carrasco. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, I'll just I'll just be uh, be quick. I know we have a very long uh, evening. I'm glad that this item is coming up and we'll be uh, voting on it. Uh, and uh, and I'll be supportive of uh, Councilmember Foley's uh, memo. Uh, you know, this uh, this item came before us uh, long before, of course, the charter uh, the our our charter review commissioners. Is that what we're calling them? Um, and I wanted to thank uh, obviously uh, all of our volunteers, all of our uh, commissioners that were reviewing this and uh, very grateful for all of the work that they did. I know that we've thanked them before, uh, but this was uh, this was a long and uh, and uh, and complicated issue to to review, including all the other issues that they that we'll be discussing uh, later on. Uh, and and I want to thank all of the folks that were also involved previous to that who were very involved in collecting all of the signatures that unfortunately uh, didn't make it onto the ballot for un, uh, for complicated reasons. Uh, I was involved in that process and uh, was very supportive from the very beginning and um, and was part of, uh, of that conversation uh, truly uh, uh, from the very, very beginning. Uh, and for for some of the issues that uh, Council Member Foley brought up, and many of the speakers who called in, primarily because we know that uh, for a city such as the city of San Jose, it brings out voters, and uh, and we have a city that is very diverse, and we want to make sure that especially when we elect our our uh, our mayor, the person that holds the highest power. We want to make sure that that person is uh, is elected by a diverse community and by folks who uh, who will be represented by that person. And so, 
making sure that we do everything and anything possible. Uh, and I agree actually with council member Davis, if we could spend money in getting out the vote, that would be fantastic. But, uh, but I don't think that that's enough. I don't think we go far enough. So doing everything that we can, such as what other cities have done in moving the election to a presidential cycle, uh, we know that that increases uh, the, the uh, voter turnout. And so, so it's been a very long process. Uh, I know that it has been a rocky, rocky road. Uh, and I'm uh, hopeful that this time around, uh, because of the engagement and because of the process that we've gone through and because of the active uh, participation of our residents, of those who have really vetted this out, uh, individuals who ha are experts in, in elections and, uh, and research, they've come in and they've talked to us and they've brought in wonderful uh, studies. Um, they've been uh, great in engaging our, our council colleagues. So uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that this will pass this time around. And I wanna thank uh, council member Foley. I know that uh, as you were just discussing, uh, sometimes we have a change of heart and, and, uh, and, and it has to do with, uh, you know, changing of time, uh, new research, uh, thoughtful process, provocative thinking. Uh, but uh, I think it takes a big person to really uh, be able to come to terms sometimes and just, ha you know, have a, a change in thinking and, and, uh, and a change in vote. So I want to thank you, Council Member Foley, for, um, for what, what I think is, is the right thing to do for our city and for a very diverse community. Um, so that's it for me, Mayor. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Council Member Foley. Thank you, Council Member Sparta. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to say a few things. I also wanted to thank Council Member Foley for her change of heart um, and for the thought that she's given uh, this issue. I also think it's the right thing to do. Um, and I, you know, I think one of the callers mentioned it. Um, you know, my father was very active in the, and his birthday was yesterday, so he's been a lot on my mind. Um, and he passed away a few decades ago. So, um, you know, he was part of uh, a very active in the fight to move to district elections. Um, and so our city, frankly, by design, had not been inclusive. Um, and uh, we have a lot of the legacy of that in the east side um, because they didn't have local representation. Um, Reed Hillview being one of them, although the, that's a county issue. Uh, but, but we had a lot of land use issues, a lot of decisions made for communities that had no representation. And so we moved to that district election. And that was, a, that was a, an issue of equity. And, uh, and likewise, we heard um, that in 2019, we had an extensive input uh, from professors who study this issue nationally, um, that this is uh, also an issue of equity because by not putting them on presidential elections, it is by design to exclude women, minorities, youth, and uh, and so we're we're frankly making that right, um, and so it. it it is done by design. Lastly, I just wanted to concur with Council Member Foley as a co-odd year. Uh, we were elected the same year on an odd year, um, you know, and that was the mayor was reelected in June. And, um, and in, you know, so we got half and half. We were able to sort of get half of the election with, uh, with the mayor's race and then the runoff you know, the mayor had already been reelected and, and frankly, it didn't make a difference. And in San Jose, thanks to district elections, uh, no offense to the mayor, it's just, just the way it turned out. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and, and frankly, in San Jose, because we have district elections, we are fortunate. We're able to knock on every door. We go out, we talk to our residents, um, and, and that's, the beauty of our city is we're able to go out and interact with our residents on a regular basis. Um, and I think that's part of any election. Um, and, and in terms of turnout, you know, we had, uh, 
we had the presidential election in 2020, we also had a really weird election last year where we had a statewide recall. Um, you know, so talk about off cycle, that was super off cycle. And yet we had massive voter turnout. Um, and, and so uh, I do think that this will further increase our voter turnout. And lastly, um, just because of uh, some of the concerns and thank you to council member Foley for ta tackling this head on, um, which is we're moving this forward. I'm very comfortable uh, in moving this forward because this has frankly been studied the longest. Uh, this issue predates um, our arrival in 2019. Um, the council has been looking at, at this for a very long time. Um, and this also, you know, there was a campaign out, there are residents in our city um, who, who signed uh, to put this on the ballot, right? So there's been a tremendous amount of community effort. There's been a tremendous amount of thought um, and research um, in this. And so for that reason, um, I'll be supporting the motion and I'll volunteer myself to write the argument um, for, we can have those discussions later, that's fine, but I'm happy to volunteer unless uh, somebody else feels passionately about it. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Cross. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, and um, I'll, I'll start mentioning, I would be happy to volunteer and making an argument um, in favor on, on the ballot as well. This is something that I have supported for years as we initially brought up uh, the discussion. And um, I do truly feel that this is the best way we can have uh, the only individual on the council that is that is elected citywide, um, the best way we can really have uh, more of our, our voters and our residents have a voice uh, in electing that individual. Um, I think it, it uh, it goes without saying that certainly, um, you know, this is something that, that we have argued for um, for a couple of years and there was an opportunity to be able to present this um, sooner. And I think we hear similar arguments today in regards to why it's it's uh, a concern. And I wanted to present a, I think an example of, of, of where I think the the challenges are with that because I, 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 I too um, was concerned around some of the the loss of significance in these now um, gubernatorial cycles where we would no longer have a, a mayor on the ballot. Uh, but I think that the, the the difference is pretty negligible when it comes to the, the potential decrease in a council race versus the increase we could see um, for a mayor's race on the presidential cycle. Um, and that's really what I think we have to, to balance is, is sort of what are some of the, the cost um, benefits here. Uh, it, in my own election in, in 2014, and as, as, as a, one of the members of the odd number of districts, um, not being on a presidential cycle, um, we saw uh, in total just over 12,000 um, voters. And that also happened to be a contentious mayoral race. Um, and, uh, and, and unfortunately in the mayoral race, we saw um, just over 90,000 voters come out for, for that mayoral race. And when you, when you look at the, obviously the impact of the difference there, the, the multiplication of that impact citywide is, is much, much more heavily felt when you're looking at a, at a citywide candidate. Fast forward to, to 2018, uh, which was a, rather non-contentious uh, election for both uh, the mayor uh, and and myself. I, I didn't have an opponent at that point. And even without an, a, a, a contentious race there, an opponent or anything, it it, it drove out 10,000 uh, voters in, in that race. And so many people showed up to, to vote in that election, regardless of the contention or maybe the draw of a mayor's race. Um, quite frankly, obviously, regardless, regardless of any contention in, in the council race. Um, and, and so the, the drop off was pretty insignificant when it came to local district voters. And I think, um, you know, we can help cover that gap much more easily in these individual district elections um, if there is going to be any sort of drop off through some robust uh, voter outreach 
and engagement uh, as we should be doing every election cycle just to encourage our our constituents and, and our voters to to in, in, engage in the, the democratic process and um, and vote versus uh, I don't think there is um, really any significant difference we will be able to make if we are simply to invest in voter outreach and engagement on a citywide race because now you're talking about um, not just a thousand or so voters you're talking about tens of thousands of voters could be the difference and uh, and to have that type of significant difference every um, every mayoral race we would need to invest uh, a significant amount of resources in that voter outreach and engagement versus the alternative which is simply moving this race to the presidential cycle in just that draw alone is going to raise uh, the, the voter turnout by tens of thousands. And that, that I think, um, when you look at the, the cost benefit, it's certainly well worth it. Um, it's something that, that again, I think I, I have now analyzed for a couple of years now and, um, and, and do support and would be, uh, would be happy, as Councilmember Sparza mentioned, uh, to, to lend my name uh, on, a, on an argument uh, in favor on the ballot. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Rest. Thank you. I'll start off by saying that I'm also going to add myself to that list in case you all need the support and I'm happy to do it. You know, uh, my colleagues who've already volunteered are more than capable um, and, and I'm happy to happy to help out. Um, I just want to thank everybody who called in, as well as all the folks who've been um, gathering signatures um, even before 2020, leading up to 2020. Um, it took a lot of time and heart and um, belief in that we can do better than other states in our, um, in our country that are regressing voter rights rather than being more inclusive of voters and taking um, more considerations towards uh, voters and, and how to involve them. I think the county is doing a great job of, of augmenting that by having um, a vote by mail. And we've seen uh, the success that that has, um, that we've achieved here in our city. Um, but but, but uh, engagement isn't just one specific strategy and then we're done um, because we're a complex community. We're a complex a profile of, of different kinds of voters uh, with different um, party lines. And even in, within our own party lines, there's a difference between moderates and cent centered and progressives uh, and all of those, you know, democratic socialists and non and on and on and on and on. So I think it is a great idea for us to continue to um, engage in the different kinds of um, strategies that will pull people into local politics. Because I think, and I was really saddened when I was running, um, it was the first, uh, it was when um, number 45 was also running. And um, there was so much apathy and, you know, they just said, I'm, I'm just not going to vote because there was just so disillusioned with what was happening and the rhetoric that was beginning um, during that campaign season. And, and I had to do a lot of fast talking with folks to say, listen, you may not want to vote for president and that is fine, but don't leave our local, pol um, you know, local politics out because this is what really impacts us. We're the first line of defense when things um, go awry and we've seen that during this pandemic. And so I just, I, I love that, that our community continues to get involved and, and uh, thinking of different ways of how to engage and how to augment voter turnout. And so thank you to all of the people who've done that. You, you know who you are, you've begun even before, I think it was 2019 even, dare I even say maybe 2018, because uh, it just takes a long time. We know this, it takes a long time to engage in, in a meaningful way. Um, so, so thank you all for, for doing that. I also wanna thank my colleagues um, and um, really, really tickled pink uh, 
uh, that council member Foley, um, you're also um, in, engaging in this way and helping augment our voter turnout. So thank you also for doing that. Um, I know uh, all of my colleagues have the same interest. I'm not going to distinguish. I think we all sit on, on council because we believe in representation. We believe in um, getting involved politically so that we can be public servants and, and serve our community well. And so whether you vote on this or not, I think that there is also a lot of um, heart and um, in, in all of you to get our voters involved and we just see it differently. We just see, we have the same priorities. We just go about it a little differently. And so, so I wanna just make sure that we continue to um, have these conversations because I think through these conversations, we continue to grow our culture and um, create um, lines that can actually, that we can blend and unify rather than um, uh, create uh, lines that will divide us as we have seen in our country. And so I was, was it important for me to say this um, because I know that as a, as a council, we've come a long way. Um, some folks are leaving, some folks are staying on, but everybody's contributed in a slightly different way. And, um, and thanks to all of everybody who's on board, um, we've seen different um, progress. Um, I just want to share with my election, there was a challenge in, in that, um, well, not only an internal challenge, but there was also a challenge in the month that we were having the election, and that was in March. And that was really hard because nobody wants to talk to you during Thanksgiving and uh, Christmas or holidays. They just don't want to open the door, and you don't want to knock on that door because you're not going to be welcome. Um, and despite that, um, we still were able to, to get over the finish line and have that meaningful voter engagement, but that takes a lot of time and takes a lot of effort. Um, and so I, the voter uh, vote by mail having um, already begun at that point was truly, truly, truly um, uh, tremendously helpful. So um, uh, I, I just want to say that, that this is just another way. I know that there's other um, manners that we should um, engage voters and we should continue to think about those. Let's not leave those out. Let's not say that we're completely done. Let's think about how we do that. And, and lastly, um, Council Member Esparza, I love that, that you um, brought in your um, father and his role. I'm sure that there's a lot of other uh, folks, uh, different generations in our community that have played a part in this uh, leading up to today. Um, hopefully we'll see this um, across, the fin across the finish line. And there's a lot of folks like your father who, who've played their part. And, and I hope that this, this uh, vote is also homage to him and homage to a lot of the community members that, um, with, that had a lot of heart and a lot, a lot of sacrifice and work um, that was already um, that already has paved the way for us to be here today. So, so thank you, thank you, your dad. Um, happy belated, happy birthday to him, and um, and hopefully we will see a, a really great vote today. Sorry, having a tr trouble with the unmute. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just point out we're now at 3:20, and we've got four very substantive items still to go. And so I want to encourage everyone to uh, going forward to see if we can be as succinct as possible. Because I know a lot of members of the public are waiting on these other items, and I'm guessing we're probably going to need to make a transition to short public comment as well. But let's let's uh, see how many hands we got up and go from there. Uh, let's vote on this motion. Oh, you know what? Before we do so, I'm sorry, Councilmember Foley. We're going to come back to you. Uh, and I guess you're going to be uh, the uh, scrivener designate. Uh, you get to determine who who gets to write this thing. <laughs> so I flip a coin. I, I I think we heard from uh, Councilmember Esparza and then Perales and and they're excellent. And uh, Sylvia, or I'm sorry, Councilmember Arenas threw her hat in too. So do we need one name? If we need one name, then then I'll throw in the first one, which is uh, Council Member Sparza. Okay, uh, Councilor Sparza, is that right with you? I assume it is. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Any discussion on that issue? No, we'll just vote. Jimenez? Jimenez? 
Was there was there a comment before I vote? I don't know. I thought I heard someone else chime in. No. Okay. No, I don't think so. All right. Yes. Morales. Yes. Cohen. Aye. Crosco. Aye. Davis. No. Esparza. Yes. Arenas. Yes. Foley. Aye. Ahan. Aye. Jones. Aye. Licardo. Okay. Uh, Licardo, I didn't, I didn't get your vote, Licardo. That was I. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item 5.1 is the addendum to the amendment to the San Jose International Airport. Uh, I'm sorry, Mineta San Jose International Airport. Master Plan Environmental Impact Report for Outdoor Advertising Digital Billboards. Uh, there is a presentation on this item. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. John Aiken, Director of Aviation. Um, I have a PowerPoint coming up. Um, next slide. So today the Council is being asked to adopt the resolution approving the addendum to the amendment to the Norman Wine Mineta San Jose International Airport Master Plan Environmental Impact Report. We're also conducting a public hearing. This, this page you've seen before in my presentation last time, starting with September 25th of 2018, that's when the council voted to adopt the new direction in council policy 6-4. There's been a lot of discussion about public involvement openness through this process. Prior to September 25th of 2018, uh, in, in June, uh, it was presented to the Airport Land Use Commission which is a public meeting. In August, it was presented to the Planning Commission, which was also a public meeting. Prior to those two public meetings, city staff did a lot of outreach on phase one, which is the billboards on city property, which is what we're talking about right now. Back in 2017 and 18, there were three focus group meetings, including environmental people, historic preservation groups, VTA and the sign industry. They also met several times with Lick Observatory, plus two meetings with art groups, the Tech Museum, San Jose State University, Team San Jose, the Downtown Association, and the SVO. We conducted two community meetings, both in October of 17 on the 5th and on the 12th. And just for note, there was no, no digital billboard San Jose group until we started the work on phase two, the, the private site. So that's a little bit of the background before you even voted on 6-4, which allowed for billboards um, on the public property. And then going forward through the rest of this list, you've heard it before, but August 6th of 2019, council voted on a memo that included the airport billboard sites not being in the RFP process for the remainder of the billboards, and that we were going to use our own uh, uh, existing advertising company. In February of 2020, Clear Channel submitted a project plan, which I approved, which is part of the process of 6-4. Um, on February 25th of 2021, council voted at that point to stop working on phase two, but reiterated their support of phase one, which is the city owned sites. Then in July and August of 21, we had open public comment on the, on the environmental review for our sites at the airport. And then in January of 2022, just last month, the airport commission voted to recommend approving the addendum to the EIR. This again is an excerpt from the August of 2019 memo, uh, putting the four airport sites outside the RFP. We're only moving forward today on two of the sites, 2200 Airport Boulevard and 2341 <laughs> Airport Boulevard. Uh, and then the paragraph below is an excerpt from that memo that talks about us planning to use our existing uh, contract for advertising. Some of the terms of the agreement from the date of installation through 2027, 
55% of gross revenue on the sign uh, is airport revenue. Uh, the MAG, the minimum annual guarantee is $490,000, which is $2.5 million over the term. There is no capital invested by the airport. Marketing opportunities, the airport gets to utilize 10% of the advertising time. So six minutes every hour, uh, the airport gets to use to advertise our new markets, new flights to new destinations, and just general awareness of the airport. And Clear Channel has uh, volunteered to take down eight billboards in San Jose. Um, the eight billboards will be located in the city of San Jose. They've been directed to work with PBCE to take those billboards from locations that are unsightly or incompatible with the surrounding land use, which is part of Council Policy 6-4. Um, the takedown billboard policy here, I believe, is the easiest way to remove billboards in the city because current billboards on private property have certain rights for that billboard to be there. Uh, as a side, Caltrans also requires two billboards to be removed along the freeway. Now, in addition, not part of this part, but I know there are concerns about the trees uh, that I've heard from several council members. 43 trees are being removed as part of this project. 42 of those 43 are non-native to the state of California. So one native tree and 42 other random trees that were brought in. Because those 43 trees are being removed, Clear Channel is replacing those trees with 141 other trees. There was also some discussion about taking down a mature tree and putting up a sapling. The 141 trees are trees that are in 15 gallon containers. These trees are, are purchased uh, by our city forest. The types are selected by our city forest and the city arbor. So these are semi mature trees uh, as they go into the ground. Within council policy 6-4, we did work with the Lick Observatory. They provided feedback into the process. Because of that feedback, we're turning off the billboard from midnight to six. We're tilting the billboard down towards the ground at 15 degrees. They have automatic dimming capabilities on the billboard, no white or bright backgrounds. And we're incorporating elements from the International Dark Skies Association guideline. All of that is in the council policy 6-4 and all of that clear channel agrees to. Back in, back in 2018, Prior to the decision on 6-4, the city was in discussions, as I mentioned before, with Lick Observatory, and the airport sites were noted in that discussion that they were far enough away to be outside the area of influence of the observatory. They're about 16 miles away from the observatory. Go ahead. Now, with regard to light shielding, uh, policy 6-4, added a lot of extra light control. These are all of the things that they're doing. They're shielding it from being from going up. They're shielding it from going side to side. Uh, the illumination will be set close to the moon's illumination. Uh, the uh, automatic dimming on the system. Uh, there were health concerns raised by some of the uh, public in their comments. Uh, staff has spoke with the Epilepsy Foundation the issue with uh, epilepsy and LED lights is mostly focused on the flashing and moving lights that you would see in an entertainment or gaming industry like Las Vegas. These are not allowed to flash or, or move. The, the, the images on the screen are not allowed to on this one. FAA approval, uh, I know that was one of the issues that was discussed the last time we were before council. The FAA hasn't, has issued uh, a finding of no objections with the terms and conditions of the sign. Um, on the issue of, of the RFP process, Clear Channel followed all of the city rules and processes. This is a three-year public process that's been transparent. The airport has publicly communicated our intent since 2019 
And the city, when building policy 6-4, had been doing that since 2017. Clear Channel received all of the required approvals for the city to move forward with this project. The city attorney's office was actively included and approved the process that we did with Clear Channel. After receiving the, those approvals, Clear Channel has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on an open and transparent environmental review going beyond what was simply required by law. Within the business case, the contractually, we will be getting 55% of the gross revenue with the mag at 490,000. Um, comparative billboards uh, in, the, in the airport industry, uh, New Orleans Airport gets 35% of gross. Victoria International in Canada gets 35% of gross. Piedmont Triad in North Carolina gets 37% of gross. Now I know none of those sound like they're in the Bay Area and they're not, but we went out and went to the dynamic billboards in the area. So San Carlos, they have two electronic digital billboards, one at 35%, one at 30%. Belmont and Oakland, both at 30%. South San Francisco at 15%. Milpitas and Alameda at 10% of growth. The last time several council members asked me, how do I know I'm getting the best deal without doing an RFP? When you look at that kind of performance differential, I don't think there's a question that we have the best deal that we would be able to get without an RFP. The only reason we're at 55% of growth is because they're, you, they're putting this billboard in the existing contract. The existing contract requires 55% of growth, period. Whether it's a wall wrap on one of the garages or whether it's this billboard, it's set at 55%. If the, the currently during COVID, Clear Channel, who is our advertising vendor, was 83% over MAG during COVID. The only company that was paying more than MAG uh, during the COVID period that we're still mostly in at this point. If they got 83% above MAG on this billboard, the revenue to the airport would be about $900,000 a year, about four and a half million dollars of the term of the project. I want you to remember the $900,000 $900, a year when we get to the next slide. The, the CPE for the airport um, before COVID, I got a chart here. The CPE for the, for the airport, the cost per plane passenger, this is an average cost that the airlines pay for each in-plane passenger. In 2019, when we were growing at a very high rate, our CPE was $8.21. A great CPE, very competitive in the Bay Area, and it's what, one of the reasons we were growing. In FY20, COVID hit in March. We had eight good months before that, the last few months drug us down. Our CPE rose to $14.79 for the full fiscal year of FY20. No federal money was put into that budget. We were able to close the books without using the, the grants that were offered to us. We deferred those grants because we knew the next year would be even worse. In FY21, our, our CPE went up to $36.68. And that's with using $55 million of federal aid to get us down to that point. We would have been just shy of $50 per in-plane passenger with no federal participation. FY22, the one we're, we're completing right now, is budgeted at $22.10 per CPE. And that's utilizing $26 million worth of grant funds from the federal government. As we move forward, it's imperative that we get that CPE back down to the 2019 level as quickly as possible. So I had staff work out 
what does a million dollars of revenue mean to me? A million dollars in revenue means reducing the CPE by 36. So every time Clear Channel, if they produce the $900,000 because they're 83% over the mag, that is direct revenue to the airport that is 100% profit. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to support it. I don't have to air condition a terminal building for it. It just comes to me with no strings attached. That money goes straight into our fund and can reduce that CPE by 30 cents. So every 30 cents will draw us closer to getting back to $10 or below for our CPE. On the airport debt, I wanted to explain again how lucky we are that things happened at certain times in our, in our existence. Our debt service every year was over $90 million a year up till 2021. In fiscal year 2021, we refinanced the bond. So our, our debt service in FY22, which was one of the hardest years we got hit with the COVID thing, our debt service dropped to below $50 million. Stayed there for two years because when we refinanced, remember we put most of our savings up front to help us and then we went to a lower but still flat future. So in 2024, our debt service payment goes back up to almost $70 million and then stays there. So we have a great two year time period where our debt service is low. I have to prepare the airport for an FY24 debt service that is just shy of twice of what I'm paying right now. These kind of revenue sources are very helpful in us trying to position ourselves to get to a point of being able to take on the debt service that's coming in 2024. Within our airline lease, 75% of that debt service is covered by the airline, but 25% is covered by the airport through all of our revenue sources, whether that's the parking or GT fees, uh, GA ground rents, and these billboards all goes into the airport share of paying 25% of almost $70 million. So I wanted to emphasize the fact that although it may seem small, it's a critical component to us being able to manage our CPE and manage our debt service as we move forward. Remember for those council members that are new and haven't heard this before, the airport is self efficient. We have to raise enough money to cover our, our bills. We do not take city funds. So we have to manage that $70 million of debt and we have to manage it with reasonable cost per employment or the airlines will scream at us and pull out. So we have to balance those things on our own, on our own budget, separate from the city's general fund. So again, at, at the end, I was just gonna leave this up. This is what's actually being asked of the council, adopting a resolution to approve the addendum to the amendment of our master plan environmental impact report and conduct the public hearing. So with that, Mr. Mayor, I'm happy to answer questions and uh, we'll be here for you. Thank, thank you, John. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, let's go to members of the community now. Caller 3266. Good afternoon, council members and mayor. My name is Mark Gleason, and I'm here speaking on behalf of the officers and business agents of Teamsters Local 853. Teamsters 853 has been supportive of this project now for a few months, and we sent correspondence to that effect. Our initial support was working with the contractor Clear Channel Outdoor, and we were appreciative of the full employment that was offered to our members during the pandemic. We're here today to support the approval of this project, and we hope you do too. Uh, we appreciate uh, the the support that everyone has given us so far, and we hope you'll you'll uh, see to it that this is approved. We also highlight the fact that the sequel finding is in favor of this approval. Thank you. 
Salvador Lopch. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor, honorable members of City Council. My name is Salvador Yock. I'm the Deputy General Counsel at Clear Channel Outdoor. I'm here to speak in favor of and ask for your approval of the amended EIR to allow two digital signs at San Jose Airport. It's our belief that this process was fully compliant with the policies and procedures of the city. We entered into lawful agreements with the city. We received approvals from airport and planning staff that in turn received approvals from the city attorney. I also want to take this time to address recent misstatements about our privacy policies. We want to assure you and the people of San Jose that contrary to what has been published, Clear Channel does not collect personally identifiable information in connection with our measurement products. We can't speak to why that article was published just now, but uh, it's, our, it's our position that you know, that was uh, poor timing and very inaccurate. Our billboards have no cameras, no hardware, and no software attached to them for measurement purposes. Again, Clear Channel does not track consumer behavior through telephones. The only information we receive is from third-party data providers. These reports are based on completely anonymous, aggregated information, and these third parties represent to us that they comply with all applicable privacy laws. Use of third-party data analytics for advertising is ubiquitous in the industry and ubiquitous throughout society. We thank you for your support and attention to this matter, and I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Bob Schmidt. Bob Schmidt. Hi, hello, members of the council, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm the regional president for Clear Channel Outdoor here in Northern California. We started a process two years ago and today respectfully ask for your approval of this environmental report allowing digital signs at the airport. We followed the rules, we followed the process, re receiving approvals from airport staff, city attorney and city council throughout. We have followed a fully transparent process where the public had the opportunity to evaluate this project multiple times over two years. We have already received environmental approvals from city planning, the airport commission and the FAA. This project mitigates the concerns of stakeholders who care about safety, the environment, the night sky and who want billboards removed. Not all billboards are alike. This is a good project and the airport has been a great partner. We will deliver on the intended benefits of policy 6-4. We will reduce the overall number of existing billboards citywide. The removal of existing billboards will show social equity. We will generate revenue for the airport that is much needed. We respectfully ask for your support of the environmental report. Thank you. I'm here to answer questions as well. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, there was a lot of controversy when the billboard topic first came up. It went through the Arts Commission, not necessarily the airport one, but just billboards in general. It was going to the Arts Commission, and that was suspect to me. It's like, why are billboards going through the Arts Commission? This is, this is, that ain't art. That's advertising. That's that's city business, and so just everything around that soured me on this particular topic. Number two, the person that's giving the presentation right now, a couple weeks ago, he was giving false information and he got, he got nailed for it. I mean, the, the senoras from the nonprofits nailed him on it. Okay, so anything that came out of his mouth today is, is suspect. Number three, you're placing something near an airport so that the people that are flying in, all these 400,000 people that you're gonna be having, in the way that San Jose is going to expand, you just want to use that as a means to generate cash. You know, and, and so it, it's like that isn't being talked about because this is what's being planned. So just everything around this topic, man, it just, I don't care if it's the law, okay, because slavery was legal, okay, and so was redlining. That was legal too. So just because something is legal, doesn't mean it's okay, doesn't mean it's right, 
doesn't mean it's ethical, doesn't mean it's moral. So I think we have a moral and ethical obligation in addition to observing the law. And sometimes those don't square, you know, and sometimes protest needs to happen. You know, sometimes confrontation needs to happen with the government because we have a constitutional protected right to address all grievances to our government. Dashiell Leeds. Hello, my name is Dashiell Leeds. I'm the conservation assistant for the Sierra Club Loma Prieta chapter. Uh, the Sierra Club is uh, strongly opposed to the proliferation of electronic billboards in San Jose, including the resolution before you today. Uh, we urge the council to instead follow the airport commission's recommendations to one, reject the billboard proposal, two, to amend the city's sign code and policies to eliminate billboards, three, to study other ways of generating revenue, and four, to enforce the prohibitions on illegal billboards and blighted billboards. Uh, there's overwhelming public opposition to new billboards in San Jose yes, and for good reason. We've stood with San Jose community members in opposition to any expansive light pollution in the city due to the effects not only on community members, but also to the environment and our local ecosystems. Our chapter has voiced our concerns in the past, and we would like to reiterate those today. Quite frankly, artificial light at night should not be installed adjacent to the Guadalupe River. Thank you. Juliana Pendleton. Good afternoon, Mayor Licardo and council members. My name is Juliana Pendleton, and I am the Environmental Advocacy Assistant for Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. Santa Clara Valley Audubon is opposed to any new digital bill. Oh. In fact, SCVAS has been consistently and vocally opposed to electronic billboards in San Jose since 2017. These billboards create visual clutter and light pollution that increases stress, harms birds and wildlife, and degrades quality of life for all. Please follow the Airport Commission's recommendations to one, reject the billboard proposal, two, amend the city's sign code and policies to eliminate billboards, three, study other ways to generate revenue, and four, enforce the prohibitions of illegal billboards and blighted billboards. Thank you. Todd W. Well, that presentation certainly was pro billboards with no rebuttal, but San Jose residents have overwhelmingly rejected electronic billboards. Please represent and speak for the people. Vote no on any new billboards and refocus efforts on removing all billboards in San Jose. Our voices don't seem to matter to our council as this is still even on their agenda. Money and votes seem to be the only catalyst. First, vote for mayoral and council candidates that actually listen to and represent the voice of the people. Second, we need to take grassroots efforts to the next level. I propose the citizen takes matters into their own hands. Let's put all businesses that use billboards for advertisements on notice that we will boycott their products and services. Everyone start taking pictures of billboards and posting them on next door to support the cause with the title, No Billboards in San Jose. This will render them worthless. Spread the word, we can completely rid San Jose of all billboards. Let's clean up San Jose and make it a beautiful city again, starting with no billboards. Thank you. John Miller. Uh, good afternoon, this is John Miller. I am with uh, No Digital Billboards in San Jose. I urge you to adopt the recommendations of the Airport Commission, especially to review Policy 6-4, because here's what we don't know about Policy 6-4 and Phase 1. We don't know the total amount of revenue the city would receive annually when all 22 plus locations under Phase 1 have a digital billboard in operation. We don't know why the city council rejected the planning department's recommended 10 to one replacement ratio and adopted a four to one ratio instead. We don't know who would decide which conventional billboards would be taken down using what standard. We don't know the total number of existing conventional billboards that would remain standing at the end of the implementation of phase one. We don't really know 
why the city is fighting in court to prevent illegal digital billboards on private property on the one hand, while at the same time spending countless hours of city staff time to allow new digital billboards on public property. We don't know why, after almost seven years since billboards were first declared a city priority, do these questions and other important questions remain unanswered? So how can you properly evaluate a proposal without this crucial information being known? So what do we know? I think it's very safe to say we know the city council doesn't understand the implications of policy 6-4, which it passed with no adequate public outreach or input. Now is the time to follow the recommendations of the airport commission. Thank you very much. Anthony Leonis. Yes, good afternoon, mayor, council members. My name is Anthony Leonis and I represent Outfront Media. There is a fundamental issue and a threshold question that we all need to ask and not just gloss over. And that fundamental question is whether or not the airport and Clear Channel have the authority under the current 2007 contract for this project. The 2007 agreement is primarily for in-terminal type advertising. It does not include outdoor billboards. There was an amendment in 2010 that allowed Clear Channel to introduce additional locations. However, the prohibition of outdoor billboards remains. If you look at section 4.7i of the 2007 agreement, it expressly says that outdoor advertising is prohibited under that contract. Yet the airport and Clear Channel are trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. Why? Because they don't want this matter to go to public solicitation to an RFP process. However, the current agreement does not support what Clear Channel and the airport are trying to do here. Uh, I also note that in the presentation, there was an assumption that this is the best deal that the city could get. And there were graphs about other deals and other jurisdictions and I don't know where that information actually came from and what it was based on. However, I can tell you that the deal that is proposed by Clear Channel is not the best deal that the city could get and Outfront is prepared to make a better deal to the city. Thank you very much. Mike Sodergren. Yeah, Mike Sodergren, Preservation Action Council. Um, well, we're trying to preserve the things that are truly distinctive to this place we call home, such as the Lick Observatory, which is the most prominent, but not only example of why I'm commenting today. Um, PAC maintains that the initial study addendum is wholly insufficient to take into account the cumulative impact of historic and cultural resources and, this, and aesthetics that are at stake here. Um, the city of San Jose should consider the impact of approving digital signage for advertising on public lands as it relates to future inevitable legislation by private property owners demanding the same privilege. The digital billboards industry also has, goes to great efforts to argue through experts that there's no impact to observatories dark sky operations. This is hardly objective and a definitely far too limited of analysis a full EIR would fix that. Um, when James Lick commissioned the observatory, it was the first that was on a mountaintop. Why? Because mountaintops are clear of the light and the uh, dense air that you have at sea level. It was a first and it was done here. They continue to do historic firsts here. The astrophysicists that are up there today, you see that on the mountaintop. Every day you look up at Mount Hamilton and Copernicus have done adaptive optics so that they can look optically further into the universe than they ever could before by squishing a lens, making a liquid lens. It's amazing what the UC Observatories is doing. Anything that we do for the number of dollars that are at stake here is sacrificing one of our most valuable historic assets and the ongoing capabilities of that organization. Thank you. Paul Linem. 
Good afternoon. My name is Paul Lynham. I'm an astronomer at Lick Observatory. First of all, I want to comment on the dates mentioned in the presentation, which are meaningful. UCO, the University of California Observatories, was con uh, consulted by the city in August of 2018 about billboards in the downtown area, primarily 17 city owned sites. At that time, there was no phase one or no phase two in the terminology. We gave our recommendations, which appeared somewhat reduced in Council Policy 64. In the more than three succeeding years, no approach from the airport came to the observatory until December 2021. That's three months ago, and we've had no further approach from industry representatives. According to the airport director's presentation, the proposal only began for the airport billboards in August of 2019. Therefore, the observatory urges the city council to adopt in full the recommendations of the airport commissioners, first and foremost, that we remove the pre-existing illegal billboards. Dissatisfaction with the, with the billboard process at the airport has been expressed in all quarters since the policy 6.4 was adopted in September 2018 by council members themselves, industry representatives, the airport commission, and through immense public outcry, including, as we heard on it today, mothers out front. During the adoption of the policy, there were assurances given to ameliorate concerns and have a change of heart or direction on hearing back from the community. It would seem that thus far, these assurances have not been fulfilled. The people have spoken to quote Commissioner Hendricks. They exhort the council to listen to the people, adopt the commissioner's recommendations in full, add to the city's climate smart credentials, remain consistent with the long-term objectives of the city, and leave the city's decades-long world-leading reputation for responsible. Steve. Steve needs to update his Zoom. Steve, please log off, up, go back into your Zoom application and update the software and then raise your hand again. We still have a few speakers and you will probably have time to still get back on. Um, Sue D. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, the first thing I would like to say is that um, the city council should follow the lead of the airport commission. And I'd like you before you vote to ask yourself why did the airport commission reject this proposal not once but twice they rejected it you sent it back and they rejected it again. Um, i think you need to take a look at that and also remember that the san jose city council did ban the construction of new billboards on public land in 72 and citywide in 1985 so why is that changing now I also found the initial presentation to be very one-sided. They commented, as some other Lick Observatory speakers have said, the initial presentation said Lick Observatory, all their um, conditions had been met, and yet Lick Observatory is saying that's not so. They talked about the 43 trees being removed and being replaced, but the mature trees that are already there now, they act as a buffer uh, for the freeway, the Guadalupe River, and the airport. And um, the, one of the big issues I have with illuminated billboards is we're having a real problem with traffic fatalities. And I find these billboards to be a great driver distraction. Not only that, but they're energy hogs and um, they create the light pollution. A lo local businesses will not benefit usually the consumer products are not from local businesses. And I think it's gonna be insignificant revenue plus the overwhelming public opposition should be taken into account before voting on this. Thank you. Matthew Raffitt. Yes, my question has to do um, with what involvement or role does the city have in moderating the content on those billboards? And in other words, what is in the MSA? And the reason, reason I ask that is because as I was, sometimes I drive through Nevada by way of Southern California and the non-digital billboards are an embarrassment. 
Um, you'll drive past, if you're on a highway, you'll drive past one that is advertising a strip club. Uh, and then within two minutes, you'll get to another billboard advertising a church. And then the next one will be uh, an anti-abortion sign. And so that's the point of, it just seems as if there ought to be, you know, obviously that's happening because I'm driving through a uh, rural non-city area and advertising is cheap. So, but my question is, what involvement does the city have in moderating that content to ensure that we don't end up with poor quality advertising? Thank you. Call in user one. Yeah, I mean, these electric billboards are kind of tacky. I mean, are we trying to be Reno or whatever? I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I'm for freedom of speech, but I don't, you know, like the other caller said, and I, I actually lived in Nevada for a while, and they are a distraction when you're driving. Uh, I, you know, what you can put on them, well, that's a matter. I mean, I can imagine this city council would probably have some, you know, you have to be a left wing company to be on the billboard. I'm sure they would. If it goes up, they're going to dictate who gets who gets to advertise or what. You know, you're not going to be able to advertise a firearm. That's for sure. At this city council, I can just for me, it's just it's too much trouble. You know, it's going to be too much regulation for. I, if I was Clear Channel, I wouldn't do it because can you imagine the 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 Karens on the city council? What they're going to dictate once it's up? Can you? I mean, hey, you guys at Clear Channel, be 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 prepared for for. Uh, the Karen City Council, what you can and can't do. I just don't. Personally, I don't like them, but I, I have a hard time being able not to tell Clear Channel that they can't use freedom of speech. And as for, you know, around the airport, that airport's so ugly anyway. It's an eyesore. You know, maybe maybe putting up a billboard would polish that turd of an airport. What they should do is maybe do something inside the airport that makes it better. I mean, it's the most depressing airport, both inside and out. So, feels like something that would be like in 70s uh, Eastern Europe or something, but uh, I don't know. Uh, in, in the end, I think Clear Channel should be really careful doing business in this city. This, this, is, uh, this, this, this city council is a bunch of socialists. Uh, you just wait, to, wait, wait until there's going to be uh, more fees for you guys. Believe me, they'll, they'll stack them on. They like to make fees and fines hurt. Just ask Raul, Raul Perales. And, and you guys will see. You guys will see what's going to happen. Les Levitt. Thank you. I'm Les Levitt from No Digital Billboards. One thing we kept hearing from council members was an attraction to the notion that in exchange for allowing new billboards, some old billboards could be removed. But the reality is that even after years, there are no specifics. On the day of the city council meeting, Clear Channel said they'd take down some billboards. Where? Not known. Who decides? Clear Channel. The city has not counted billboards, there's no permit process, and there's no location database. If you vote yes, thinking that putting up new digitals will clean up the city, do you understand that only a small number of billboards would come down and hundreds would still be in place? And if you vote yes, you would be supporting a flawed swap policy. We'd say Clear Channel should have from day one been required to take down 16 billboards since the plan has four separate 1,000 square foot faces for the signs planned at the airport. Please support the airport commission recommendations and recognize that a comprehensive review of 6-4 and phase one is warranted. This is not just about four billboards at the airport. Thanks. Tim Clausen. Hi, um, council members and mayor. I I'm writing once more in, in this um, forum today to, here to speak to oppose any construction of electronic billboards within San Jose. Um, yet again, the airport commissioners overwhelmingly voted to recommend to you, our council and our mayor, to oppose the electronic billboards. Um, would it not be your job as elected officials 
to follow the will of the people. Um, the, the fact that they're gonna just take down trees when we're already losing our, our city tree canopy is alarming in itself. But then you start adding to the electronic billboards as a distraction to drivers, which is counterintuitive to our city's vision zero goals. I personally suffered from a car accident because of divided attention on our freeways, which resulted in me having to have back surgery. The electronic billboards um, would affect the visual aesthetics of our skyline, the quality of life for those who would be utilizing the Guadalupe River Trail up north um, from the downtown by the airport, as well as wildlife, especially after dusk to midnight. Um, also, um, if electronic billboards go up, state laws would make it impossible for them to ever come down. We're basically lining the pockets of Clear Channel in order to sell out our city and what we have now is freeways that you're driving and you're not being distracted. We have enough problems with people driving that don't know how to drive in the lack of officers for traffic control to then add one more distraction on our highways. And who pays for all the lawsuits and litigation once accidents start happening? I can't find a DOT study that supports having electronic billboards in any highway across this nation. Vote to oppose and do the right thing for those who put you in office. Thank you. Steve Cohen. Steve, you should be able oh, to unmute. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, the gate, you know, where those trees are is a big issue because it's a gateway to the city, not just a gateway to the airport. And a proposal to put 120 trees somewhere in South San Jose uh, does not adequately cover the loss of 43 mature trees. Uh, native or not, almost all the trees that are in San Jose right now are not native. So that's not an argument. Um, if the airport, you know, a million dollars is a lot of money to me, but if a million dollars is going to make or break the airport, maybe we should really look at who's running the airport and what the numbers are like. Because when you do look at the numbers, actually, it's a small percentage. And even the gentleman from the airport said it was 30%, 30 cents, I'm sorry, a person. I don't think that's exactly a deal breaker. I think the real question is, are we going to follow the commission? Uh, you know, who's running the city? Is it the special interest groups or is it the people? I mean, you've had petitions, emails, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly say they don't want the billboards. So it'll be really interesting to see the vote since three council members are running for mayor and are they running for the people or are they running for the special interest groups? Uh, again, you know, the commission is supposed to help represent the people. The commission said twice, don't bring, do the billboards. And I urge you to follow the commission, follow the people, and don't approve these billboards. I think it's a step in the wrong direction that we can't go back and reverse. Thank you very much. Rashi. Good afternoon, Mayor Licardo and San Jose City Council members. As a member of the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society, I feel that the growing opposition to electronic billboards is not surprising. In the five years since Council started promoting electronic billboards, scientists, environmental groups, grassroots community groups, and thousands of residents have engaged, all expressing unwavering opposition. These billboards create visual clatter and light pollution that increases stress, harms birds and wildlife, and degrades quality of life for all. They attract drivers' attention and are hazardous to drivers, bikers, and pedestrians. Their messaging communicates with electronic devices invading people's privacy. Unlike other issues in the public realm, with differing opinions and feasible compromise, the pervasive and unavoidable impacts of electronic billboards are impossible to reconcile. The Airport Commission provided good recommendations for Council to reject the billboard proposal, amend the city's sign code and policies to eliminate billboards, study other ways to generate revenue, and enforce the prohibitions of illegal billboards and blighted billboards. The Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society supports these recommendations. 
Tessa Woodmancy. Oh, thank you so much. Yes, Tessa Woodmancy. Um, basically, I'm so glad to hear Tim Clausen. He was amazing. Thank you, Tim. And um, Meredith Muller contacted me, my neighbor, you know, saying, is this up? And I said, okay, let's go look. And, you know, th this is very much concerning of our neighbors. Thank you, neighbors. Thank you for, for standing up for, for degrowth. I mean, that's what we're talking about here is degrowth. And that's what the science says we have to do to get to zero emissions by 2030. That's eight years, okay? That's what we're talking about. And really, what well, we need to keep it in the ground now, because as we're seeing, keep fossil fuels in the ground. And when we're, we're taking away trees and we're promoting air travel, and you know, and and even on our buses, it says the buses at the airport say go somewhere. This is a problem because we have to stay home and create a hyper local economy if we are going to survive as a species along with the million other species that are on the agenda to go extinct in the next couple of decades okay so this is where they say if the insects go we go and that's what's on the table is that the life on earth and the audubon is saying you know that we need to protect the birds and you know what we're not we're not focusing on our problem which is our climate crisis and that's why it's going to be an uncontrolled demolition of you know destruction and death, which is you know in our future. And, you know either way, it's going to be in our future. But the best thing is that we stop burning fossil fuels. And so to promote anything that gets people to go fly, go drive, go go here, go there, when we need to start you know creating a hyperlocal, which means growing food and being producers, not consumers. And you're not promoting that. You're promoting everything that's antithetical to that, antithesis, whatever the word is. Thank you. Ryan Globus. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor Licardo and City Council. My name is Ryan Globus. I live in San Jose in D6. I'm asking you to oppose these billboards. I, I just want to especially highlight, as some of the previous speakers have mentioned, the distracted driving concern. There's an epidemic of distracted driving, whether it's texting or using buggy Tesla software hitting bollards in downtown San Jose. Um, look that up on YouTube, that has happened. Um, and this is an especially dangerous area, uh, 101 near the airport. Uh, you know, with the 87 interchange there, you know, you have a lot of traffic building up. You have people cutting in at the last minute to try to avoid that traffic. I've had to slam on the brakes many, many times uh, navigating that interchange as people cut in at the last minute. Uh, and so this is a very dangerous place to put more distractions. So I urge you to oppose. Thank you. Back to the council. Uh, thank you. Uh, John, you, you described CP in some detail. Could, could you just explain why CP is relevant uh, as the airport's struggling to attract uh, flights and, uh, and stay fiscally solvent? Yeah. You know, all of the airports are, are set up differently. And so airlines over the years have come up with CPE as a benchmark of comparing airports. And so uh, when, an, when an airline comes in and wants to see, okay, if I bring in a flight, what are my basic costs gonna be? And we tell them, look, for each in plane passenger, your cost is gonna be about $6, $9, $30. And if we're up at $30 uh, and that same airline goes to Oakland and asks, hey, I was thinking of bringing a flight into the Bay Area, what is your CPE? And they say theirs is 10. The airline sits down and kind of value, value engineers the flight opportunity and discusses within themselves the market share. We may have a stronger market, but if our cost is significantly higher, uh, is it better for the airline to go to the lower cost airport? I think it's, uh, you know, it's a factor that we've used a lot with the airlines um, and the dramatic change during COVID was a shock to the, our airline partners. They understood the shock. I mean, everything was, was a little messed up during COVID, but it's a huge shock to them. And I think it's important to realize as we grow out of this, as we bring British Airways back in June, as we, you know, work towards bringing back the Asian flights as soon as uh, those countries open up to us, uh, bringing back Canada, the East Coast, all of those different flights, 
it becomes imperative for us to be uh, within a target range of our competition. And I see Oakland and San Francisco as our competition when we're looking for new service. And so it's imperative for me to stay in line with those airports and with all the other airports in California for that matter. And so uh, it's, a, it's a tool that the airlines use. And basically what it is, is all the costs that the airlines would pay divided by the number of employment. And that gives you that cost per employment and it allows you to kind of compare airports. It's not an exact science, but it gives you a rough comparison to the different airports. And so it's really important as we grow out of this that we're able to you know, encourage the airlines to come back, that we have reasonable rates and charges, uh, and that they're seeing a trend. Right now they're seeing 30, 30 something dollars go down to $22, and they wanna see that trend of coming back out of COVID. So this is an important time for us to have a CPE that continues to drop back below $10. Thanks, Sean. I, um, I just wanted to ask the question because I think a lot of folks don't understand that CPE and what exactly it means at least in the public. And so I want to make sure folks do understand this is really a key determinant for whether we lose flights or, or regain flights. And uh, right now, a lot of people's jobs depend on us being able to continue to have flights at the airport. Uh, so, and not to mention a lot of folks who depend on our airport for, for travel. So in any event, uh, I just wanted to clarify that issue. Um, I, I heard very clearly from the public and we've been hearing very clearly from the public, public hates billboards. <laughs> and, and by the way, I think if you took a poll in the council, I think uh, it'd be 11-0. Uh, we would be happy to have a city without any billboards. Um, there's overwhelmingly pop, uh, public opposition for all the reasons we understand, just that they're aesthetically unattractive uh, and we know where that blight is most frequent. Inevitably, the, the billboards go in neighborhoods near freeways. Those neighborhoods are often low-income neighborhoods that are already most uh, challenged by issues of blight and crime. Uh, and those neighborhoods suffer the most. Uh, so here's the problem, though. We're not starting in 1940. We're starting in 2022. Uh, and we've inherited a city with dozens of billboards pre-existing to all of us, none of them approved to my knowledge, while I've ever been on the council or as mayor, uh, it's my knowledge all of this got here first. Uh, and we'd love to tear down all these billboards tomorrow. Uh, now, Nora, my understanding is we actually can't do that because there are property rights attached to the billboards uh, and agreements. And essentially, if we did that, we'd have to go find, I don't know, tens of millions of dollars to go pay off property owners and, and billboard companies. Is that, is that fair? Um, that's correct, Mayor. Um, there, there are property rights in the billboards. Okay. So, so we'd love to tear them all down. We can't really do that unless we somehow landed on a pot of money. Um, but I think we kind of arrived at something, and that is in policy 6-4 with a teardown requirement, where for the first time the city would allow for digital signage in our city uh, if, in fact, we're able to tear down all those awful blighted billboards, or at least some of them, right? The idea is to tear down more than we would ever erect. Uh, and the idea was, and, and I'll just speak for myself for a moment, because I actually voted against doing so citywide. I didn't want uh, these electric uh, signs citywide, and I voted against that, but then eventually came back to the council and it was very clear. If we're going to allow them in downtown in the airport, those are the only two places in the city where I think they're would in any way be appropriate. And, and we could tear down many more billboards in neighborhoods. We could actually address the widespread public concern for tearing down neighborhoods in the places in which they live. And so uh, we came up with policy 6-4. And by the way, that policy was a while ago that we approved it. What was it, 2019? I can't remember. Rosalind, do you happen to remember? 2018. 2018, okay, thanks. Remember 2018. Thanks, John. Thanks, Rosalind. So yeah, so three or four years ago. So this is not news. We had a lot of public hearings prior to that, a lot of public discussion. And we made that decision because we believed that there was a trade-off that was worth, worth making. And that is, if we're going to have billboards in the places that is electronic signs in the places where people expect them, like at downtown, then we could remove a lot of blight from neighborhoods where people most wanted to see billboards gone. And that, after all, I think is a worthwhile objective. And that's what policy 6-4 reflects is a, six, is a four to one teardown requirement. 
By the way, I think we can do better than that. I think we could get a better teardown requirement on this contract and all future contracts too. Uh, but fundamentally, that's what the council voted for, for the obvious reasons. It is a greater benefit to our public to see more billboards down than up. <laughs> a straightforward math. Uh, and to be clear, I know Les Levitt said something about there's no permit process. Actually, there is a permit process by understanding. Is that right, Rosalind? For billboards? Uh, well, yes, Mayor. For There is an RFP process that's outlined in the amended 6-40 that any proposals would have to follow. That's correct. Right, but also for existing billboards. Uh, some of them I know pre-existed the time when we had permits, but others were, were constructed pursuant to a permit requirement. Is that right? That, that is correct. My understanding that others were erected uh, through a permitting process, yes. Okay. And a policy 6-4, the planning department would decide based on what's the most blighted. And I assume that Clear Channel or whatever company would probably want to identify those billboards where the leases have expired. But ultimately, uh, the city would, would control that because the city controls the permit. Is that, is that fair to say? Well, Mayor, I think I may defer to John Aiken on what Clear Channel uh, would propose in terms of the, the teardown. Um, you know, obviously the airport staff and planning staff would, would certainly uh, support that effort in determining where the teardown should take place. Well, I assume the airport staff wouldn't be determining where it would happen in the city. We've got a planning department for that, don't we? Uh, the, planning, the planning team and airport team would work together because these particular sites are at the airport sites, we would, of course, want to include their staff. Okay. I believe, Mr. Mayor, uh, Rosalind was referring to there was a permit process when the sign was built and erected, not a permit process that kind of goes through its operating life cycle. So there's not a permit renewal or anything on those. It would have to be a clear channel billboard that was identified as blight and clear channel would would choose from the, I don't know, say they have 20 billboards in the city. They're supposed to take down eight. They will, you know, they will work with the city to tear down eight, but it might not be the number one eight that the city wants. It might be, you know, six that the city prioritized plus two others because of financial benefit. Unless the council comes up with direction that it has to be, you know, the top eight blighted ones that Clear Channel owns. Right. I, think we can, I, I can see direction like that as right the council could give direction it says look all of them have to be in low-income neighborhoods right where the average median income is less than 80 percent and that could be a reasonable direction that would be reasonable okay i guess here's what i'm getting at i know my time's just about up we've heard from a lot of members of the public who are upset about this and they should be because nobody likes billboards we haven't heard from a single member of a single neighborhood where these billboards are actually going to get torn down. Those are the members of the community who are not represented in this discussion. And those are the members of the community who could benefit, not by tearing down four to one, but if we went to, to six to one, if we had 12 billboards we could tear down, as I've recently discussed with Clear Channel, they'd be willing to, to actually take down. And we could restrict them and say, look, they've got to be in the neighborhoods that are most afflict, afflicted with blight. And, and we could use, set up some objective criteria. It seems to me that could be a condition of our approval. And if they don't like it, then certainly they can refuse to comply and simply uh, and not construct any billboards at all and walk away from the deal. But we have the ability to constrain that and protect the public. And my concern is all those quiet voices, this, the silent voices who don't know because they don't know about the opportunity to have a billboard removed from the very place they live in exchange for a very straightforward uh, proposal, which says we're gonna put electronic billboards in a largely industrial space and two parking lots between the airport and 101, where there are already a bunch of electronic billboards anyway, just drive another mile or two up in Santa Clara, you'll see plenty of them. So I think there's a lot more that we can get out of this deal for the public from Clear Channel, beginning with tearing down 12 rather than eight billboards, uh, I think we can also mandate that they use total green from our Santa like clean energy. So there's all non-GHG energy uh, that is used. That means 100% renewable or hydro uh, to power these things. So there's no environmental impact. I think we could have a higher tree mitigation requirement. So they have to replace every tree with five trees uniformly, regardless of what kind of tree they are. 
um, you know, we could really target these takedowns, but we can only do that if we say yes. And I would say, if we're going to say no, I would want to hold the next bidder to the same standard. Because if our ultimate decision is we're going to go out for a new RFP, then we should require them to also have a six to one take down ratio. We should require them to have, give us 55% of the revenue like Clear Channel is and to have the same minimum mag or higher. Uh, we should be holding the bar very, very high. And that's what I urge. Regardless of what this council decides, let's hold the bar higher for everyone, no matter who bids, so we can do better by our public. Councilor Jimenez? Well, uh, th that was a lot that you shared, Mayor. Um, <laughs> I appreciate all the commentary. I, I like you, think that uh, we can do more. And um, I also very much appreciate all your other comments. I think, uh, in my mind, uh, Clear Channel has really played by the rules that as have been laid out before by, by the city. And so I mean, I'm inclined to move forward and moving a recommendation to approve the uh, the staff recommendation. But I guess with in terms of process, right? Uh, I know sometimes we, during the course of some of these uh, meetings and conversations, we're, we're sort of um, slapping things together and coming up with different scenarios and different way to get things done. So I have a process question, maybe more for, it's for staff, but I'm curious if who I asked that to, I don't know if it's you, Rosalind, or someone else, or maybe the airport staff, but assuming we wanted to move forward in a way that the mayor just mentioned as it relates to, you know, a higher takedown ratio, uh, additional trees, clean energy, all that uh, great stuff, I think. How, what would be the most appropriate way to move forward in that manner, assuming we were going to approve this? Is, is it just simply giving staff direction to develop some of this criteria and then come back to us? while all the while approving the the amendment to the eir and and having this hearing or I, I would say that the most efficient way would be to approve the eir and and this project plan with these additional stipulations and i deliver that to clear channel and if they don't agree to them like the mayor said then we they step away and we we move a different direction but if they say no that's reasonable then uh the the billboards get built and the city gets a, a significant reduction in billboards and perhaps the start of a new tree canopy in the neighborhoods, right? That that may be without trees at this point. Yeah, John, I, I appreciate that. I guess I guess I'm wondering as it relates to, for example, where some of the takedowns of the billboards are going to take place, right? Do, do you need us to be explicit as to where we want those to come down, right? Uh, or, or, or just give you direction to negotiate some of that, or how do you see that happening? I think the direction that the mayor suggested that they be in neighborhoods that meet these criteria, and then the planning group who has a list of billboards in, in these neighborhoods, uh, and the airport staff work together with Clear Channel to make sure as much as humanly possible, they follow that direction. Um, but I, I, the mayor threw out some some income levels for neighborhoods, some some blight levels for neighborhoods, and I think that's all a, an appropriate uh, target to put in there. Okay, and, and I assume, John, that uh, as the mayor was, uh, you know, going down the list of, uh, of host of things that we can do, that you were taking notes. Yes. <laughs> can you can you remind me and recite some of the things that he uh, that he touched on? Yes, the mayor referred to uh, requiring them to use 100% of the clean energy from uh, San Jose Clean Energy. Um, he went with a six to one takedown above the four to one that's currently there. So that would be 12 billboards. And he went with a five to one replacement for trees, regardless whether they're native or non-native. It's just five to one uh, for those trees. And then Within the billboard component, the mayor talked about, I think he said the 85 percentile of income um, as, as a- I think, uh, I think it was 80. Yeah, that's what we used to determine okay. okay. low income Sorry. under the housing standard. Yeah, 80% medium, yeah. So we could say a majority of the takedowns or whatever number you prefer, uh, Councilman Minutes. Okay. Okay, uh, all right, so listen, all that sounds good. The only thing I would say, and, and I, you know, I'm gonna make a motion and give direction that essentially that, that, that encompasses and brings into the fold much of what was said already. 
Um, the only other thing I would say, I, I would add that the, that the replacement trees be in a dis, in, you know, we, we went over a, a, a community forest management plan, I think it was called, uh, and we recognize that there's certain parts of the city that are missing, uh, obviously, a host of trees and canopy and such. And so the only additional direction I would add to what you have written down, uh, John, is that the replacement of those trees be in those districts that need more canopy, say district five, say district seven. And so being explicit about that, I think is important. Uh, and, and I'll leave, uh, leave it for uh, council member um, Carrasco to, to comment on that if she sees fit. Uh, but uh, anyhow, I'll make the motion to approve staff recommendation A and B, uh, the, the amendment to the master plan uh, EIR uh, amendment, and then obviously the public hearing. In addition to uh, the things you jotted down that were uh, the mayor's recommendation, which is a six to one uh, takedown ratio, which gives us about uh, 12 billboards coming down, and then the five to one replacement of trees. And, and as I mentioned, uh, specific to certain districts that need uh, some assistance with the canopy. And then the 80% of uh, income uh, uh, in certain areas, I, I think it'd be good to do that as well. And that's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Uh, second from Vice Mayor. Okay, uh, Council Member Pross. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, and appreciate the, the discussion here from city staff uh, and the work um, and our community input as well, Mayor. I think you, you make some good points and these are uh, we've been talking about for a couple years now as we, as we have gone down this process. Um, and I think really trying to find an opportunity to reduce some of the blight um, and, and really the oversaturation of blighted billboards throughout our community, but specifically um, in, in some of our lower income communities. And, and that's something that we have seen um, throughout our city and, and recognizing that we did not have the authority to, um, to just take those down um, without paying significant cost to that um, and potentially even going through legal challenges. And the opportunity that was presented over the last number of years was this takedown ratio. Um, and I would agree with you that, that there are some, some opportunities there that um, we've attempted to take advantage of. And, um, and, and I, I have been supportive of that in addition to, I think the recommendations you propose and that Councilmember Jimenez has proposed here um, that could also benefit our community. Uh, I think that you know, we have the leverage in that regard if we're going to allow something like this. My main concern in this regard, and as it was put in the memo, <coughs> excuse me, that I issued and, and, and co-signed with you and a couple of our colleagues um, at the end of last year, is in regards to the actual um, RFP process itself. And I wanted to, um, to, to highlight and speak to some of the, the, I think the concerns that I had, and, um, and I recognize in 2018, uh, there was some direction to move forward that uh, if I were Clear Channel, right, clearly um, in their sense, being led to, to believe that what they were doing right now and the investment they were making in the IR was, was completely possible. Um, and based on their, their contract that they had uh, from, from back in 2007 that I think was amended in 2010, and it's that amendment in 2010 that, that is the understanding from um, both our city staff and, um, and Clear Channel that gave the authority to be able to, um, to propose these outdoor billboards. Um, and in my reading of it, um, I, I, I don't see that there clearly articulated at all. In fact, I, I see the opposite where um, there's specification on um, outdoor billboards that speaks to its need to be facing um, towards the, the airport or, or be uh, airport advertising. Um, and then there is a, I think some pretty broad or vague terminology in regards to other marketing opportunities um, that may come forward and, and, and really just a broad terms on, on saying, you know, that, that, uh, the the contractor here um, would have an opportunity to propose some other uh, uh, opportunities, and so that I think is is not at all uh, clear as to to the language being specific around 
outward facing digital billboards. And I think it's, it's well known that back at that point in time, both during the original uh, RFP in 2007 and then the amendment in 2010, uh, that, that digital billboards were not being contemplated because those were explicitly um, not allowed. Um, and certainly the technology uh, over time as well was, was something that was advancing and, and at that point was not contemplated in that RFP uh, or in the amendment. And so I think had, had that have been more clear in 2019, um, I believe, um, uh, or 18, excuse me, getting the dates mixed up here on, on when we, um, on when we, we allowed and gave permission to move forward with the airport sites without, uh, a specific RFP, um, for, for me, I would have highlighted it then. Uh, but the language was even vague when we proceeded there, uh, that, that was, um, you know, did not specify, I think truly, uh, something clear as a direction to provide digital billboards that were again, outward facing on airport property. And so it has not been clear um, as it's gone through this process and, and, and it did become, or at least to me, I should say, and it did become more clear to me uh, at the end of last year as this was coming forward. Um, I know we have a lot of scrutiny in general on digital uh, billboards and, and signage and light pollution in total. And that's what's really, I think, brought the added attention and added scrutiny. Uh, and, and in doing so, for me, uh, made it very clear that we should not have allowed that to uh, to proceed without an, uh, a new RFP uh, and, and thus why I presented that recommendation at the end of last year. And so uh, I, I'm not comfortable with accepting um, the staff recommendation here and, um, and, and would be comfortable uh, with it going back out and issuing uh, an RFP, um, but I will uh, wait and hear from more of my colleagues uh, to determine on on the need for another motion uh, or not. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Esparza. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I uh, actually had um, a question. I was intrigued, um, Mayor, by your comments at the beginning and um, the opportunities that might exist here, um, and. Uh, wanted to uh, see if Councilmember Jimenez would be willing to accept an amendment um, that uh, we could add to the equity screen that would be applied, that we could add police beats that have 20% more crime to the equity screen that's proposed. Okay, so this, so the intent of this is to, to add that additional screen in order to potentially open up other locations that can take advantage of the takedown, right? Correct. Maybe, well, we may locate some of the 12 that we want to take down. Correct. Sure, sure. I'm, I'm open to that. Okay, thank yeah. you. And I don't know who the seconder was. I think uh, it was uh, Vice, Mayor. Vice, Mayor. Okay. Vice Mayor. Is it Vice yes. Mayor? Vice Mayor, that's right. I'm good. Okay, thank you. That's it for me. Thank you. Okay, so the uh, motion's amended. Uh, Councilmember Cohen? Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a few questions um, and, and just to run raise some concerns I have about, about the, uh, still have about the proposal and ask maybe it's questions for John and potentially if we, we, have, we had the person from Clear Channel on and said he was ready to, ready to answer questions. We're, we're asking, or some concessions here that are beyond what was in the initial proposal. Do we want to potentially ask the Clear Channel representatives right now what they think of some of these concessions, or do we want to just propose them to John and have him negotiate them after? You're you're welcome to do either, Councilman Cohen. Uh, it's your time, okay. certainly. All right. So let me let me just start with um, the question of takedowns. I think takedowns are important, and I think that that's what we've all been aiming for. Our policy six four in the city has to, has a takedown ratio of four to one by faces. Um, and, and right now we're asking for a total of 12 takedowns for these four large faces that are being put up. So what I'd like to do is stick with the, that 
you know, not necessarily have this deviate from the policy and require that we be going four to one at, at a minimum on a face to face basis that may still result in no more than 12 takedowns because you could have some double face signs, but it guarantees that at least 16 faces would come down um, across the city. So I prefer something with, with um, that higher number of 16 faces to match the four faces that are going up. Um, and I don't know if there's a, a question or a proposal that I'll, that I'll ask for. Um, let me continue on some of the other proposals. Yeah, Councilor Cohen, if I could just offer, the suggestion I had six to one was for signs, not for faces. So right. it could be considerably more than 16 faces. It could be, but it could be less. And that's my yeah. concern. So we can certainly have that minimum, yeah. And so we sure. so we could have a, a combination of minimum 12 signs, minimum 16 faces, but sure. I'd like not to allow for an opportunity to have fewer than the four to one face-to-face -face ratio. Right. Um, that would be my my hope. Um, my, my just in, in, in combination with that, you know, there's, a, there's also a large, this is a large, these are large signs. And I know that, that we've had this conversation a little bit um, behind the scenes with some folks and I've been talking to Clear Channel and others about whether this size sign is necessary. Um, the standard billboards in the city now or that, that are considered standard billboards are 14 by 48. The proposal here is for signs that are 20 by 60. So they're twice the surface area of traditional billboards. So, you know, I've even started to wonder whether we should get more takedown for the larger size. Um, my per preference would be to just go for this, to try to make the sizes smaller because one of my big concerns about this project is energy consumption. Um, and obviously the reduction in the size of the sign would reduce the energy consumption. So um, maybe I can ask John that, that question. Is there, is there something magical about the 20 by 60 size that, that you'd like to preserve? Yeah, what we've um, what we've heard from Clear Channel is that in the freeway environment, the 20 by 60 is the standard size. So uh, if you go up and like the mayor said, if you go up just a couple miles, you have a couple more digital billboards. They're all at the 20 by 60. That size sign allows you to have the size font that you can read as you're traveling past the sign. So I think the smaller you get. Uh, the, the less readable the message will be to those traveling by. So there'd be less uh, value to the sign um, versus a sign downtown where you may be at a stop site, right? And you're, or a stoplight and you're not traveling at a high rate of speed. So I'm not sure that going away from the, uh, the standard in this situation uh, to smaller would be something that uh, that would be acceptable. It would be my guess. That would be my my guess from Clear Channel that they would have issue with that one. Um, okay. I think the the signs being LED powered, um, they are more energy efficient than you know normal light lighted signs. But you're right. The bigger the sign has more LEDs, uh, the power consumption goes up. But just to understand, LED signs are notoriously much more energy efficient than you know, the other alternatives for lighting. Well, yeah, I mean, the Clear Channel's already gone around the city. And we know that, by the way, we know there's something like 330 billboards across the city. I think that's the count that I got. Um, I, I've seen a, a mapping out of where the billboards are. So, um, but I, as far as I know, Clear Channel, and I think, I'm not sure about all of our vendors, but Clear Channel has gone around and replaced all of the, the, um, in, the uh, halogens with, LED floodlights on their billboards now. So, so the energy usage would be quite more significant to have an entirely lit face of LED. I think the EIR says that the power consumption of these billboards combined is about the same as for 24 homes, which is a large lot of, a lot of power. Um, so anything we can do to reduce that or offset it is important. Um, the other thing I was gonna mention about the sign and lighting in the sky is that and I've, I've, I've paid much more attention to billboards than I ever did before as I drive around the city. But um, the, the, those floodlights on billboards point upward um, on all the billboards around the city. So those 300 something billboards have lights that, that basically point up into the sky. And so during the night, you're, you're putting a lot of light pollution out into the sky. So there is an advantage to taking down standard billboards from a light pollution standpoint, because we wouldn't, we're taking down signs that have light pointing upward 
and installing signs with shielding around the lights to make sure they're only pointing downward. So from a light pollution standpoint, I think we can gain from doing, you know, maximizing our takedown. Um, I'm still concerned, obviously, about power consumption. Let me ask the maker of the motion for two friendly amendments, one friendly, two friendly amendments, I guess. One is I don't think you captured in the motion um, the part that the mayor said about making sure that the, power, the billboard is powered by clean energy. I didn't hear that in the, by San Jose Clean Energy. I want to make sure that's in the motion. Yeah, that was meant to be in it. I'm not sure if uh, John recited that. Yeah, I didn't hear it, so I just want to make sure. But yes, that the intention was to put that in. And then my second friendly amendment would be to um, increase the take or ensure that the takedown is a minimum of 12 signs and a minimum of 16 faces. Yeah, I, I'm inclined to support that. I guess, you know, as I was listening to your line of questioning, Councilmember Cohen, I was wondering, did, and maybe I missed it, but did you, uh, and I know obviously this is up to us to, to put forward these terms that are that are amenable for the city, right? But did, did you happen to ask Clear Channel sort of what their thoughts are on some of your questions or? We've asked them on some of these things. I mean, we, we got, okay. I know that they said, they mentioned the number 12 would be possible, but mm -hmm. I, I haven't, that's why I haven't specifically asked them today about a higher number, but I'm hopeful that this is a somewhat of a minor difference because they could make that happen with double-sided signs. So, um, yeah, just, I'd be inclined to accept that. Yeah. Okay. 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 Mr. Yes. Mayor? Oh. I accept oh, it too. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, I interrupted you, Councilman O'Connor, and then uh, John. And was John going to say something? Uh, go ahead, John. I just wanted to add a little bit to your light pollution theory that remember the downtown billboards that are uplit do produce a lot more light. They're also on all the way through the dark night. These digital billboards get shut off from midnight to six. So the overall both power consumption and light pollution is dramatically less on these. So you would get a lot less uh, overall lighting if you took down old fashioned billboards, right? That keep the spotlights on all night long versus shutting them down like we're shutting down the digital. Right. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. I think the light pollution argument is there. I'm not still not sold on the energy consumption argument. Um, I wanted to ask uh, somebody on Clear Channel a question about what I've been talking to them about a lot. And I know there's a technical challenge right now with powering the billboards with solar. What I'd love to see are digital billboards that have so their built in solar power so that they're not using even anything off the grid at all. Um, and I know right now the technology isn't there. But what I'd like to ask them is about their um, openness to using, leaving the space there so that in the, as we move forward, they can begin to experiment with what kind of power generation they could do on the tops of their billboards. And maybe at some point the technology will allow for that to work. And if we can get that built in as a potential future enhancement, that would be, um, I think, a good change. Tony, is there someone from Clear Channel or or uh... Bob Bob Schmidt would be the individual from Clear Channel if Tony okay. promote him. Can you be All brought right. over to the panel to respond? Yeah, I clicked promote to panelist. Okay. Bob? Yes, hi. Can you hear Welcome. me? Welcome. Yeah, were you able to hear the question from Councilman Cohen? Yeah, um, as Councilman Cohen stated, um, the, the technology does not exist. Um, to, to do that. Um, we're open to, to energy, you know, to looking at things and, and projects. I think what we also need to consider is um, if you're putting, you know, solar panels or trying to put solar panels on top of billboards, you're likely going to have an FAA issue and different things like that. So there's a lot of practical things that I'd like to say yes, but I don't know that they'll be overcome. So um, we'll try to be, you know, agreeable, but the technology doesn't exist. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that would be great to figure out how we can work on this issue. And I, I know I'm getting over my time, but let me ask one more question. Um, of John, I think this question is for, oh yeah, this question is for John. Um, right now, the airport is, you know, doesn't have, isn't on San Jose's clean energy, right? Net, we're, they're net, um, consumer of, of energy for sure, um, and, and you're not powered by San Jose Clean Energy. Is, is that something that we could do is convert as part of this, ask the airport to, to try to convert to San Jose Clean Energy to encourage more product, uh, production of clean energy elsewhere and, and improve um, sources? We, 
we are on San Jose clean energy. We are at their 85 plus percent clean energy. Um, and prior to COVID, we had put in a budget request for the additional uh, $300,000, I believe, to go to 100%. But because COVID hit us so hard, I had pulled that out of the budget before you saw the budget uh, for fiscal year 2021. Uh, we, can, we can look at adding that back in. I, I'm not sure that this year is the right year, but uh, we have a sustainability plan for the airport and one large component of that is joining that program. So it is a focus of mine and the airport team to get on the 100% section of San Jose Clean Energy. So, so can I suggest perhaps as part of this that we say, since we're talking about minimum of 450 and a, and a potential goal of $900,000 a year, that once we are generating that revenue that we use the first year's portion of the first year's revenue to convert or we use that revenue to make sure we can convert to the San Jose 100% clean energy? You can give me as much direction as you want. So I'd be happy to do what we need. Good, I like that answer. So I'd like to ask for that additional friendly amendment that we'll use this revenue to make sure that San Jose Airport is on 100% clean energy. Sure. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. As a All yes. Right. That, that, I'll, I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Carrasco. Here. Uh, so, uh, so I'm sorry if I, if I, uh, sound, uh, redundant, uh, John, would you just, uh, would you just review for me just one more time uh, and, and explain to me, uh, like I'm a, a four-year-old, please, why did, this didn't go out to an RFP? So this, this went out to an RFP in 2007 for our advertising at the airport as a whole. At the time, it was limited to indoor advertising. We did an amendment in either 2009 or 2010 that opened it up to any advertising opportunities on airport property. It was a very, it was a broad statement because as you know, things in technology move faster <laughs> than we can keep contracts up with. So we left it broad so there were opportunities. At the time, electronic billboards facing away from the center of the airport weren't allowed because policy 6-4 wasn't there. But we left it broad, so if that policy ever changed, we'd be able to do those kind of opportunities. So in 2009 or 10, we changed the agreement. We started putting big building wraps on the outside of our garage facing the terminal, so you couldn't see it from the 87. So we put wall wraps on the glass wall down the middle of the airport roadway, right? That separates the different lanes of traffic. So we really got into outdoor advertising after 2010. Now things have changed and council policy 6-4 got approved. We utilized that broad statement of outdoor advertising and, and proposed projects of new opportunities for Clear Channel to propose to us a new opportunity that included billboards that were compliant with 6-4 and billboards that were inside of our advertising uh, contract that we had. So uh, I think Councilmember Perales's concern was the vagueness of the statement. I was, I was, uh, I think it was purposely done because of the changing atmosphere of, of advertising. I mean. When we signed that contract, we didn't have the giant LED mesh signs that we have now. They weren't invented yet. So we used a broad statement. So that's how we're getting to the point where they can propose any advertising opportunity on airport property. Um, what is kind of the, the broad statement that we're using to not do an RFP and to stay within our agreement. There's also a benefit to us uh, indoor advertising complements outdoor advertising. So having it under our master concession agreement for advertising allows someone who's buying digital advertising space in the terminal to also buy the billboard at the same time, right? Gets a better saturation 
of their brand, it brings a better revenue source. That's why we've always wanted to have one person in charge of advertising at the airport, one company uh, in charge of advertising at the airport. Did that help at all? I guess. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to find, I said like a four-year-old. <laughs> no, well, um, I, I, I'm gonna, okay, so. <laughs> I guess, I guess as a four-year-old. If other council members followed it, I, I'm, if Pat, Pam Foley is giving a thumbs up. We'll be happy to tell you that I'm the only one time. that didn't follow it. <laughs> If I was to do it as a four year old, as a father, I would say I could give my four year old the opportunity to have a snack or an orange. The snack is very broad. So my, my four year old could go grab three Oreo cookies or an apple or the orange. If I say, oh, yeah, you can go have an orange, it's very, very defined. There's no room for alternatives. So I now have given my four-year-old the opportunity to look at everything on the counter, make up his decision or her decision about what they really want and have that as their snack instead of being a very prescriptive parent who said, no, you can only have the orange slice. Maybe that's better. Oreos, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so, you. Thank you. <laughs> See, right. that wasn't so hard, was it? <laughs> I just had to go back to when my kids were four years old, which was a long time ago. So, okay. So, thank you so much. I, that, I, I like I said, uh, four-year-old, please. Uh, so, um, so you said two thousand and seven. Uh, that was a long time ago. Yes. Uh, so, does that actually apply to current situations, though? The, the contract was extended throughout the period. And so it still is uh, applicable now through the end of the contract, which is 2027. I, I think what's important is to understand the things that happened between 2007 and now. The contract was signed in 2007. Everything was great. A year and a half, two years later, we had the recession of 08, right? Where the bottom dropped out and traffic fell and all of our vendors were having a hard time. We made an amendment in 0910 to react to that new reality, right? Which was the trying to come out of the great recession. As they got out of the great recession, we added things like outdoor advertising, like on the garages and on the center wall um, to help bring up revenue during that recovery from 08. Then we get into COVID Things go down again. Clear Channel is strong. They have a great program out here. They're able to beat MAG during COVID. So this thing has transitioned through a couple different turmoil periods. One went really bad, the 08. We've made some changes to the program in Amendment 2 and Amendment 3. And now we were able to get through COVID better than MAG because of those amendments we had done looking for new opportunities. Don't just stick with what you got. Be creative, move forward. It allowed us to maximize revenue during COVID because they had the freedom to propose new and creative things for me. So I think that, that long list of, it, it's been 20 years or 20 years now. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to do the math in my head as I'm talking to you, but it's been a long time, a long but time. a lot of significant things have happened over that period that made us adjust and realign the agreement with the reality at the time. So all of the conditions still ex uh, exist today that we did in amendment two. So it's still very practical to today um, for the next five years until 2027. And, and, and I know that that you're saying, you know, you can grab Ore uh, Oreos or, or uh, pick whatever you want. Uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, but uh, but back in 2007, wasn't the RFP, even though it, it uh, kept it vague, uh, wasn't it uh, prescriptive enough to say that it was just an indoor RFP? 
the, the original 07 RFP was for indoor advertising. And then the amendment in number two, and when you do an amendment, you can change those base terms. And we did change the, the norm. Oakland may very well be in a, a split situation. I, I would not deny that if you had heard that. It makes sense. But and then uh, and then lastly, what I want to ask is, uh, uh, you know, the I don't know if you've been following the whole issue that we've been discussing regarding our city canopy mm -hmm. and the loss of these trees. And I know that there is, uh, you know, the the replacement with the hundred and forty something trees, which isn't isn't much comfort to me. Uh, and uh, is there a possibility of uh, of mitigating this somehow of of uh, changing locations or looking to see how this can be avoided at any cost? The um, so the the areas that we're putting them in, we focused on small pieces of land that have no other value to us. It's a triangle between roads and parking lots. You know, I can't use it for anything else. And so uh, it, because I, I only have a thousand acres, so I want to maximize, right, every piece of that thousand acres. These are two small chunks of land that are kind of islets in themselves. And, and, and to note with the, uh, with the mayor and, and um, council member uh, Jimenez's uh, motion, it's now up to 215 trees that would go in for these 43 that come out because there's a, they're proposing a new five to one replacement ratio. So I think 215 trees, that you've got 40 trees out by the airport that nobody enjoys. No kids run under them. They're stuck between a parking lot and a freeway, right? So no kids are enjoying those trees. No people are driving by and saying, this is a pretty street. Take those 43 out and take 215 and spread them through the neighborhoods whose roadways have zero trees between the sidewalk and the curb, right? The little grass strip and start building slowly uh, uh, an urban forest, a canopy, an opportunity to uh, invest no, no, in those I, neighborhoods. I, I, yeah, I understand that. I, I get that. But when you have mature trees versus 215 trees, uh, hoping that they'll take root, and then we saw the expense of a, of a sapling to uh, that will go to fruition um, and the cost, uh, and I don't know if, uh, you know, Clear Channel is going to, if we're, we're um, if those 215 trees uh, are going to be, the cost of the 215 trees are going to be absolved as well by the company. Yes, um, Clear Channel pays for the 215 trees. To, to, to plant and see to fruition? Because the cost, if our arborist is here, or a DOT, can tell us what the cost is per tree uh, is not uh, a meager cost. I, I don't believe the cost is to maintain the tree after uh, placement. I don't believe that's the situation. And these also, or, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, these are 15 gallon trees, which are larger than saplings. It's a healthy, you know, semi-mature tree that you'd be putting in. So hopefully they would root and already be, you know, a three, four inch size trunk, right? Not a, not a small insignificant tree. I understand. Tree. But 215 um, trees is an additional cost to the city, which I'm, I'm thrilled that we'll get them. But, uh, but the additional cost, uh, it will have to be ab uh, absolved uh, somehow. And I'd like to know uh, uh, what that means in terms of uh, uh, whether, whether, by taking them down, it increases the cost to the city, uh, which means that someone's going to have to pay for that. I, I don't know if the city arborist or DOT is on council member, so I, I... perhaps would it help um, residents since this would be a planning department uh, requirement. I assume. Uh, I assume with the the standard, since you're a former planning department director. Would there be some standard uh, requirement that typically applies to any developers uh, in terms of 
what they pay for for uh, the time of uh, establishment of the tree. Thanks, Mayor. Yes, um, you know, staff, we can go back and take a look at the tree mitigation plan that's been included as part of the addendum to the ARR. So we'll definitely take a look at that, um, as well as any requirements for any additional trees that the um, that Clear Channel is also offering to plant. Sorry, Councilman Cross, I didn't want to cut you off. I just wanted to. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, and. Councilman Cross, I want to be mindful yeah. of the time. Yeah, um, and uh, well, the, the only thing I'm going to add is uh, if, if that can be part of the motion, I see where the, the votes are going to go. Uh, so if this motion goes forward, if that can be part of the motion that um, that those fees or that cost of the of those 215 trees to establish those trees can be added to the cost and be covered by the company. Okay. How That's many years does it take to establish a tree? I mean, are we looking at, I guess I'm confused on what the end date of this, I'm trying to have my conversation that I'll have with Clear Channel. Is it maintain them for a year or two years until they really establish roots and get going or? It's, well, it's look, you're, you're removing 40 something trees. Right. And, and you're replacing them, which is wonderful. But, uh, but if you're replacing them and the, the cost is to the city, then there's no benefit other than we're just getting them. But you're still, you're kicking the can down the road and you're giving the, the burden to the city at the end of the day, right? Could, could, I, could I just suggest that we would go with whatever the planning department typically requires in terms of establishment? Um, and I, I don't know what that is, whether that's two or three years, but there is some period in my understanding. But I want it, I, I like it in the memo. Okay, sure. Yeah, is that acceptable to uh, you, Councilmember Menes? I mean, I'm inclined to support it. I understand what uh, Councilmember Carrasco is saying. I just, I guess, I don't. I guess, I guess, if 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 the if the amendment's accepted, we're saying, irrespective of the cost, we want that included, right? Is that essentially what you're saying, Councilmember Carrasco? Yes, Councilmember Jimenez. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm, I'm open to that. I just, I, I'd like to better understand what that cost is, and you know, anyway, more, of, more of those details. But uh, uh, how about this? Actually, for now, I'll decline that amendment. Just simply, maybe give the staff a little time to get some more information, and then hopefully by the end of this conversation, we have a little bit more info, and then we can go back to that to that amendment if that's okay, Councilmember Carrasco. Okay, I, I, and the only point I'll make is if if we're make if we're making it part of the motion, and we're asking uh, that it be five to one, and we're going to move to eliminate four hundred, I mean forty something trees, uh, with the understanding that they're going to replace it five to one, then we need to make sure that th those those costs are going to be covered. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, and I just want to make certain that the that the that the cost what that is and curious in my mind if that's a deal killer or not right <laughs> from staff's perspective or even from clear channels perspective and so that's that's sort of where i am but thank you for for the commentary i think it's important so. okay so we'll, we'll table that amendment for now and come back to it uh, as we get more information though i, I think i'd certainly support the amendment um Councilor Jimenez, since we're talking about amendments anyway i know this issue had, had been raised particularly had been raised um in the mercury and and uh, i know it was discussed this issue about tracking drivers and persons uh, nearby, and I, I, I think we heard Clear Channel say we don't do that. So, could could we include also a condition to be no sensors, cameras, or other devices associated with the signs that could be used by the company for tracking of drivers or persons nearby? Yeah, of course, that's uh, yeah, common sense to me. And, and I and I didn't have a chance to read the the well, I did read their email, didn't read the editorial, but yeah, yeah I'm fine with that. Okay, Vice Mayor. Yes, definitely. Okay. I mean, my understanding is lots of advertisers, lots of retailers buy third party data from cell phone companies and so forth, but that's not the same as actually doing the tracking. I just want to distinguish the two. Uh, okay, Councilmember Rennes. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I appreciate the, the breakdown of, of the, the memo, um, uh, uh, John, and uh, one of the things that uh, I, I'm going to stick to process because I think I think it's clear 
where the direction of this is all going. Um, we've been working on, on, on billboards. I think it's been an eight year process. I, I first, um, when I first, my first year of serving uh, in 2017, I had the honor of, of approving the clean energy department and supporting it. And we got that up and going quicker than we've gotten this sorted out, um, this billboard issue sorted out. And I think it's probably because we, we, we didn't, you know, we didn't delineate all of these things that are coming up for us, like who's going to pay for the trees afterwards. And I mean, those, those are details that are important that we probably should have fixed to begin with. And I think having those recommendations very clear in our memos, and this is something that I'd like to ask um, Jennifer, our, our city manager, um, that when there's these things, when there's exemptions to um, uh, to certain, uh, like there was an exemption in the, um, in our citywide, um, uh, in the, the, oh gosh, council policy 6-24, I think that's what it was. <clears throat> and when that memo was um, developed, I think it was in the, I think it was in the body of, I, I forgot, and I, I'm losing track of the memos with so many of them um, occurring over time, but whatever memo that included in the body of the memo versus the actual recommendation that the airport be exempted, and then um, this, obviously, you know, there is a, a broad, um, a, a broad, broad, I'm going to call it now the snack policy. <laughs> um, and this broad policy allowed for some of these um, new technologies to to get um, folded in. Um, but but this is with new technologies, this, these are all the questions that that happen that go along the community wonders about, hey, are they going to track me? Hey, this this um, um, it, it, how is this going to look? Is it going to be one face, two faces? You know, all of this, all of this um, needed to um, be uh, detailed out in that conversation with 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 the policymakers. And I feel like this is one of the reasons why we really shouldn't have these kinds of exemptions in the body of the memo. Rather, very specifically in those recommendations. So everybody knows exactly what we're discussing and what we're approving. Mind you, there's a lot of things that happen in the background of a memo, um, but something this important, I think, should be part of the recommendation. And so I see you shaking your head, uh, Jennifer, unless you wanna contribute to something, I think you're agreeing. I, I agree um, and I understand the point. Yeah. You can work on that. Yeah, I, I, I'm not gonna belabor that point. I, I think that um, we're moving in a direction where we're seeing the benefit of taking down some of these old um, billboards. I have a, a portion of Tully Road, uh, Council Member Sparza has the other half of that Tully Road in between us. We have um, just some significant uh, visual blight. And these aren't the pretty kind of billboards, right? These aren't the, um, the flat, well, not flashy, not in the, in the light sense, but, um, the kind that that um, you see in in a, a major city, these look like, like I, you know what? I'm not even going to qualify them because I was going to say something. Um, so I'd love to see the takedown of those so that we can have uh, a nicer um, uh, site for our uh, lower income communities, and those are the communities. I'm glad. I think it was Council Member Sparza you included that in this motion, and I'm really supportive of that. Um, I do think that 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 th we're taking a step back in order to fill in um, some of this, some of the blanks, some of the blanks of like what are these snacks? What are we actually talking about? And um, and this is just part of this process. And so I think we need to, you know, we we need to make sure that we've learned a lesson, um, uh, and and make sure that when there is these issues that are so um, concerning. Um, and consternating to, to our um, community that we really take the time to develop um, an RFP or develop the policy that are needed. Um, we, we have a tutoring piece that, that we all supported last, um, 
budget. I can't even get that um, uh, that tutoring piece that was supposed to be in some of our rock programs. We can't even get an RFP with that. And so uh, if we can't get something like that, that is so essential, something like this that is non-essential and, and can, um, and can kind of skip ahead and now we, we need to figure out the details. I think this is part of that problem of, of step of um, missing some steps. Um, so so anyways, um, I, I'm, I'm not gonna belabor that point, but I think we, we've uh, come to a point where we're understanding the lesson that we are all learning from, from this process. Um, I look forward to the, the takedown. I look forward to a lot of the amendments that my colleagues have contributed um, because I think that'll um, lend itself to uh, less blight, uh, visual blight around our city and um, just a cleaner look for our airport. And so um, thank you for, for all of your work uh, leading us up to this point. Thank you, Council Member. Appreciate your concerns about the process. It really hasn't been great. Uh, Council Member Foley. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation, John, and for the public comment. And also, uh, I've enjoyed listening to the debate of my colleagues. Uh, I have some I, just full disclosure, I am not a fan of billboards. I'm not sure that any of us are a fan of billboards. We know they're not that pretty, they're ugly. The idea, but there is, they are a source of uh, advertising and that's what they're used for. Um, I don't believe we've heard a lot of comments or we've got a lot of emails from people who said that this is opening the door for other billboards it, without, throughout the city. That couldn't be further from accurate and that's a misrepresentation that we are only looking at billboards in the airport right now. Last year, I think Council Member Perales actually pulled all other billboards off the table or, or uh, expansion of billboards onto our highways off the table. And that is no longer a part of our uh, road roadmap. Um, so the idea that this, that if we approve these two billboards, it's going to lead to other billboards is misinformation and misrepresentation of actually what we're doing here. What we're doing is looking at two air, two billboards at the airport. Uh, there are three areas that have been talked about and so I'm not gonna belabor them too much, but I would like to hear from Clear Channel if that's possible because it changes the negotiations with them quite a bit. And if they say today, we're not gonna do that, then maybe we shouldn't proceed. So is, is I assume Clear Channel's around. Uh, Mayor, is it possible to ask them a couple of questions? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I believe the gentleman's name is uh, Bob Schmidt. Thank okay, you. so thanks, Bob or John. Is that, I see a John Hessler, are you with Clear Channel as well? Um, it's Bob Schmidt. Bob, okay, Bob, thank you. Uh, my first question is regarding the takedown. The initial proposal or the original agreement from you was that you'd agree to four to one per the 6-4 council policy. The motion that is on the floor is a minimum of 12 signs or 16 faces. Can you live with that? I'm not sure just yet. I mean, I, we could live with 12. One of the things I would ask the council to consider is we've dropped one of the digital faces due to the mitigations in the um, environmental report um, and converted that to a static um, board. Um, and John Hessler, the person that um, whose name he, he is with David J. Powers and Associate, who is the consultant that did the environmental report. So. Um, Okay, so you're not sure that it will be, uh, that you'll be able to accomplish it financially or what, what would hold you back from saying yes to the 12 signs? The, the council is, is um, you know, making a lot of um, asks, additional mitigations, which is fine, right? 
um, I don't know what the additional costs are associated with those. So I'll have to look at it. Our intent is to work with staff and to work with council and to get this through. So I just need to be able to evaluate that. And I don't you know, have information um, at my fingertips for some of the things that council is asking for. It would be our intention to work this through um, is, what I, is what I can say to you. I could, I could say 12, but I, the 16 is something that I just, I, I don't know right now. Okay, I, I appreciate that. And, and I know we're uh, making recommendations from the dais today and it, it may perhaps isn't what you considered, but what I'm concerned with is that we pass a motion today <clears throat> that says we want to see 12 signs or 16 faces down plus the trees um, that you come back to us in two months or three months and say, we can't do that. We want to renegotiate. And I don't, frankly, I don't want to revisit, revisit billboards in three months. I want to be, or six months. I want to be done with billboards today. So uh, I appreciate your honesty and not being yeah. able to determine whether that's um, something it's you can say yes to or not, but that's why I wanted to ask you the question. Yeah, it's our intention to say yes. Our intention is to say yes, but I'm, I'm, you know, there were also additional things which we talked about in terms of social equity, in terms of where the signs are going to come out in different districts. That is our intention to say yes to that. And as uh, the mayor noted, if we take out 12 signs, some of those signs may have one face, some of them may have more. I just don't have that information. It is our intention to not come back and revisit this. This has been a long, arduous road. I agree with you 100%. So I'm, I'm just asking you, as you're going through these various mitigations and different things, consider that. And I would just, the one thing I would, as, as we go through it too, is the 55% revenue share that the director gave a, a lot of attention to um, that means 55 cents of every dollar goes to the airport. So the funds that I have available or my company has available to handle these mitigations is limited because of the good business deal the airport is getting. But it is our intention. It is our intention to go forward. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. The next question is about the trees. We've gone from 141 trees to now 215 trees. Same question, is that within your realm of possibilities? Yes, I, I, can go to the, I can go to the five to one ratio on the trees. I just, again, I, I don't know. There's some unknowns in terms of um, what one of the council members brought up relative to the, you know, maintaining them and all that things for several years or however long. I don't have that information in front of me. Yeah, I appreciate that. The, the final, question, well, uh, staying on the trees, uh, and maybe John knows this or someone else knows this, how big is a tree in a 15 gallon container? What's the size of that tree? Um, Do you know? I, I've got the environmental in front of me. Hold on one second. Um, <laughs> what, what I'm trying to get at is uh, I, I share the concern uh, about removing mature trees uh, and replacing them with saplings and 15 gallon uh, uh, containers are not saplings, but how big are they? I have no concept of, of that. So um, I, all I see in the environmental council member is uh, if you remove a tree between six inches and 12 inches in diameter, you have to replace it with the 15 gallon um, tree. But it doesn't tell me that the 15 gallon tree is also between six and 12 inches. So um, I, okay. I, I'm not sure that I'm gonna be that smart. I can ask John Hessler, he's the environmental person who did this. Um, and he also had an answer for council member Carrasco's maintenance plan, um, which he advised me that developers are required to pay for a multi-year plant establishment period. They don't just buy the tree, they also do that. But perhaps uh, either John or I think David is also with David J. Power could maybe answer the tree diameter size. If you still want that I, answer. Are they, 
Well, maybe they could, okay. yeah. Or David now. So. Sure, qu quickly, because I'm running out of my time, but go ahead, please, David. Uh, so um, good afternoon, um, David Keon, Principal Planner, Environmental Review. I did want to say, um, so the tree size would depend on the species. Um, so I couldn't get the, how big that tree would be. Um, it would depend on the species. However, I did want to mention, we did some research and so the city has a ratio of how many, how much money to pay for trees that are not planted. And that currently in our fee schedule is $775 per replacement tree that is not planted. Um, if there is planted, then the tree, the idea is the tree will be maintained for up to three years after planting. Um, that's for our planning policy. Okay. Um, and then just, uh, thank you. Then one uh, final question about the actual signs, the billboards themselves. I've heard a couple of times that these are not uh, moving signs, they're not, uh, but they're also not static signs. Is that correct? The, there is an imagery that is changing is it a every eight seconds, something like that, as the new uh, ad comes back on? Yes, I believe that's correct. I believe it's eight seconds, but it, it doesn't, the signs do not flash, but the sign will go from one image to the next image, um, but not a constant flashing. That's the part that, you know, distracts drivers and, and is the item that affects epilepsy uh, residents would have an issue with a flashing sign, but changing from one to the other apparently doesn't have that same effect. And it's, I believe it's every eight seconds. Okay, and, and since you raised the epilepsy issue, that actually was an issue of uh, very uh, much concern to me. I have family members who have epilepsy and who ha have had uh, severe car accidents, but not related to a flashing sign, although well, her accident wasn't related to a sign, but she is affected by flashing signs. So I was very concerned about that, but I have since removed my objections based on uh, further research that I have. Uh, so I'm, I, all my questions have been answered. I, I look forward to the rest of the discussion. I see four more council members' hands raised, so I'll listen to what they have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, council Member uh, Esparza. Thank you, Mayor, um, and uh, and thank you to Council Members Cadasco and Foley because uh, the trees issue is a real issue, and um, I'm one of the two districts in the city with uh, the least canopy. And um, in trying to address that, uh, we've run into the maintenance issue. And so, thanks to the questioning of Council Member Foley. Um, it was put out there that we look at it, the cost in terms of, um, we look at a cost in terms of three year maintenance cycles um, as we set up the budgeting. And so I would ask um, so that this doesn't come out of the city's um, general fund as we um, initiate this agreement, it gives us a little bit of runway and we have the urban forestry um, the plan uh, that we're working on that we just approved and, and we're executing that plan. Um, and so I, I think it would be unrealistic for us to vote for the tree takedown and not address the maintenance issue. Um, and so I uh, wanted to, uh, thanks to the clarity that council member Foley brought out, I wanted to see if council member Jimenez would be willing to entertain an amendment um, to uh, that where the negotiation includes not just the trees, but a one uh, three year cycle, which is the normal term and how the city negotiates all of this, uh, a three year cycle for the maintenance of the new trees. Uh, yes, I'll give you an answer. Can I just ask a question to, to... John uh, with the airport. John, sure. you know, with regard to like where this money comes from for the maintenance and stuff, I mean, you know, we, we know that the um, that the airport's an enterprise fund that's self-sustaining, right? And so it, do we need to distinguish whether we want the airport to pay for this 
<laughs> or if this is coming out of the uh, fund, right? Right from Clear Channel. Oh, this is coming from Clear Channel. So yeah. they will yeah. purchase the trees and maintain them for three years, not me. There's zero cost to the airport. Okay. And as you're as I think council members are rightly establishing their footing on there should be zero cost to the city. Yeah. So Agreed. this is and like I mentioned, the standard policy for developers in San Jose is to pay for the trees, including a multi-year plant establishment period at right. no cost to the city. That's from the environmental review. So that multi-year yeah. and to account member as far as I believe it was three years, but that so I don't think what you're asking for is a stretch beyond normal city requirement for developers. Okay, so council member Sparza, you're just asking for us to be explicit about it, right? Correct. Just, cool, cool. Include yeah, that, one that, whole cycle, which is the three year cycle, because I think your your question was, but we need to be clear. And so I thought after council member Foley's questioning, it, it would be our opportunity to be clear. Yeah. Correct. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, I'll, I'll adopt that. Thank you. And vice mayor? Yes. Okay. Thank so you. Council member Carrasco's amendment has now been accepted and clarified. Okay, uh, Council Member Cohen. Yeah, just just a couple quick questions. I had been many to come back to trees also, so I appreciate everyone else talking about it. But um, I did hear John. Just quick question for you, John. I heard you say in your presentation that there would be semi mature trees that would be replacing the mature trees. Was that something you said about? Well, yeah, there. <clears throat> The, the trees that are take that are coming down, there's a chart in the environmental process about a tree between six and 12 inches gets replaced with a 15 gallon tree. So in my head, I'm thinking of that uh, orange five gallon bucket from Home Depot, right? It's gonna be three times the size of that for the root ball. So if the root ball is three times the size of that five gallon bucket, uh, to me, it would be a tree that's probably in the four inch range for the, you know, for the trunk. So not mature, not the same level of maturity, but I didn't want you to think it's a sapling. It's not gonna be this, you know, three quarter inch diameter tree that we're gonna have to wait 40 years to grow up and be a canopy. This is a tree that's already going to contribute to the canopy, uh, but it, it's not a one for one 12 inch tree for a 12 inch tree. I, I don't want council to expect the same tree. Okay, thank you. Um, just one last question. I don't know who this is for, maybe Jennifer or somebody in your office, but what is the mechanism by which the city enforces, com ensures compliance when developers and others have this kind of requirement? Because I've never been clear on how we know for sure that after we move forward with this, that the trees actually get planted and, and we actually keep track of that. Rosen, can you help with that? Sure, um, absolutely. So Council Member Cohen, as part of any environmental review analysis, and a mitigation plan is approved by the city council, uh, staff does monitor that. And we actually report on the mitigation program uh, to the Transportation and Environment Committee uh, twice a year uh, to give you updates on how the applicant, the developer, is compliant with that mitigation plan. I guess I haven't been on that committee long enough to remember, so thank you. Okay, I guess those, that's my question. I just want to make sure that we're going to... Uh, hold um, clear channel to whatever commitments come out of this and, and that we get the replacements that we need. So thank you. I should add Councilman Cohen, that is the subject of an upcoming audit. So uh, I think everyone's attention will be directed to ensuring that we're enforcing those requirements. Uh, Council member Carrasco. Uh, thank you, uh, real quick, I promise. Uh, so uh, uh, considering uh, the audit that's coming up, but uh, more importantly, the commitments, uh, I don't know if clear channel um, it is in any position today to agree to all of the uh, amendments that we're making and all of the uh, the items that we're adding. Um, uh, will we'll, uh, will we have a report back or uh, a status update in terms of uh, uh, the agreement that Clear Channel will um, uh, agree to? John, will you be able to report back to council? I can, I, I think all of council would be appreciative if I just sent you an info memo and didn't bring it up in chambers again. That, I'm, I'm fine with that. <laughs> A second. So, I, I'm so, fine with that. If you could uh, send us an info memo regarding uh, the, the different uh, items that we brought up today and uh, whether or not uh, Clear Channel is, 
is uh, agreeing to, to these items. Uh, and then um, lastly, uh, I don't know how long, maybe you've already indicated, but I don't know how long this uh, lease or contract is for and when this will go back to an RFP? Uh, it would be June 30th of 2027, I believe it's the expiration date. Okay. And and uh, and uh, and it's uh, it's indicated that that's when the next RFP will go out. That's when this RFP completes, and so we're not going to go without it. Before that, right? We we would go out before that because I don't want to be without advertising income, right? So probably six to eight months before then, we would go out for RFP so that we can have a smooth transition and keep our advertising program flowing. So my question is, John, does it, this uh, does this current uh, contract uh, get uh, amended or extended again, or does it go out to an RFP? It should go out to RFP. This has been a long agreement. Uh, I understand that it's, you know, the concern of council, and it needs to go out for RFP. Thank you. That's it for me, Mayor. Thank you. A uh, couple uh, items of clarification. Uh, Councilor Jimenez, uh, could I also ask for a friendly amendment? that uh, if we're gonna require six to one mitigation here that we go through the public process and alter our council policy six four so that becomes the standard mitigation for everyone. Um, so that way we're not playing favorites in any future dates. Yeah, so that would be an amendment to direct uh, an amendment of council policy six dash four. Yeah, so the staff would go through that public process and ultimately come back to council with a change proposed. Yeah, yeah, that sounds fine. Is that okay with uh, the second or uh, vice mayor? Yes. Okay. And then just for clarity, um, John, just so we all understand what we're voting on, because it's, it's, there's been some um, confusion. Um, if we're saying uh, 12 signs, 16 faces, that means, as I understand, it, at least four of those 12 signs have to be two sided, or some combination of that. Is that right? That's correct. And if they're all single sided, you'd have to take down 16 to get the 16 faces. So okay. I think that's the concern of Clear Channel is how many double sided signs are in those areas that you want the signs to come down and, and does right. the mathematics work? But yes. Okay. Well, then certainly if there are challenges in finding those two face signs, then, you know, that's something I imagine. Um, the requirement is that it's a majority of the signs to be taken down in. in Low-income neighborhoods is, is that is that right, um, yes. Councilor Menes? Yes. Okay. That's my understanding. Okay. I, if there's an inability to do that, I assume that there'll be uh, some council memo we can figure out um, how to ensure that enough faces get taken down. Okay, um, Councilmember Carrasco. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I stepped away to eat an Oreo. Uh, <laughs> could you tell me? Where did so I think someone indicated where those trees would go? I think it was Councilmember Jimenez. Could you repeat that? Yeah, I had mentioned that they would be. Uh, we we would look. I think I said specifically District Five or Seven, but essentially my point in saying that was to identify places in the city that are lacking canopy, so that way the trees that are going to be planted can be in those locations. Uh, could we be could we be more specific? I like yeah. five and seven. We, could we just leave it at five and seven? I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, and then and then actually, um, well, there was we were we were more specific. I think the eighty percent income threshold that the mayor had mentioned, and then I think uh, Councilmember Esparza. <laughs> there's been a lot of things that have been added to this. So so refresh my recollection, Councilmember Esparza. But you also asked uh, about uh, adding a particular. So that, was the sign that, that was for the sign takedown. down. Okay. Yeah. for the trees. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so then, so then what's touching on the tree uh, issue is then the 80% of, in, uh, you know, AMI mayor or for exactly what you said. I love oh, that yeah. was for the sign, the 80% plus yes. the prime beats was, was for the sign, sign okay. take down. And then I believe that the uh, trees was for where the canopy was needed most. And you specifically said five and seven, but we just, Fortunately, we just adopted a plan um, that that has those areas laid out. Yes, that and is perhaps correct. whatever equity screen. That I, I'm I'm guessing what we're establishing for all the other tree prioritization. I assume that would be an appropriate one. Is, is that fair to understand, or is that fair, Councilmember Jimenez? 
That that seems to me to be a fair way to yeah go about it. Okay. I think it's naturally going to touch on some of the parts of the city that folks are concerned about. So. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. In uh, in the presentation that that I put out with my staff, uh, you know, I I focused on those very low uh, very uh, low um, poverty census tracts, uh, which is another way that we could go about it. Uh, I'm sure that we all agree that um, that looking at looking at it through a, a an equity lens. Uh, is, since we've been talking about it, is uh, is uh, a way to go, uh, and I'm open to it. Um, and the last thing I, I'd say is, uh, John, is it feasible to come back uh, with that info memo in the next 30 days? Uh, yeah, as long as Clear Channel can go through and do their inventory of signs and figure out that they that they can meet the numbers, I can get the info memo out as quickly as they get a decision to me. But understand there'll be no construction, no grading permits until I get back to you that says, yeah, they're good. So thank you. Councilor Jimenez, you have your hand up. Yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, to, to whatever city staff is gonna be charged with looking at policy six four, I think it'd be good uh, to to uh, conduct some analysis and some um, community sort of input process in which we can get figure out exactly in the policy that it, in in occasions in which signs are going up and trees are coming down that we identify in a, in a more prescriptive way where those are coming where those trees are going to be planted within the policy i'm not i'm not sure if it's worth doing but it seems to make sense to me since we're going to be looking at the policy just wanted to share that so. okay all right uh i think we've exhausted the issue for now uh so thank you everyone for your good questions um and let me also thank Bob uh, and the Clear Channel uh, team for uh, working with the airport and I think presenting us with an opportunity here um, both to sustain our airport and hopefully improve uh, the city in many uh, corners of our city where it would be nice to remove some billboards and plant some trees. All right, let's vote on the motion. Yes. Aye. Perales. No. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? No. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, let's... Um, Let's see here, we're now at 545. Uh, I'm gonna suggest we take our break now and return at 630. Uh, I know we've got three items left, so we will um, probably need to, I think we're gonna re reduce public comment to one minute so we can make sure we get to these three substantial items. So let's come back at 630 and we'll resume. Thank you, everybody.